Okay, everyone, uh, welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us for the first time. So this is the second symposium in the Oxford Autumn School in Neuroscience for this year. And in this symposium, we're bringing together a group of uh, researchers from all across Oxford who are working in various ways on dementia and mechanisms underlying dementia. In fact, over the last year, we put together uh, a a whole constellation of researchers across Oxford who work in this area. Uh, and we put this under the umbrella of Dementia Research Oxford, which uh, we hope will showcase the growing and very large number of research teams working in this field. So to start this symposium off, I'm going to introduce Noel Buckley, who is Professor of Neurobiology here at Oxford. And Noel studies basic biological mechanisms uh, and is involved in the identification of therapeutic targets which might be important for treatment of dementia and he's also part of the consortium of the Alzheimer's Research UK Drug Discovery Institute the DDI at Oxford and he's going to kick off by telling us about modeling Alzheimer's in a dish how far have we come so please no come over I hope that's working now and you're here in the middle. Okay, yeah. looks all ready to go. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Welcome back from lunch. Uh, this is strange. This is the first time I've given a face-to-face -face meeting since the pandemic began. And uh, it's very odd looking at people who I probably know but can't recognize behind the mask. So what I want to talk about over the next 35 minutes is uh, exactly what I said here. How do we model Alzheimer's in a dish? Why should we do it? How far have we come? and how far are the problems. So in this, I'm largely talking about um, other people's work rather than simply my own. And I want to start with... Boom up. Okay. I'll start shouting. Okay. So I want to start with this uh, pastiche, this brilliant pastiche that was produced by Brian Ng, a uh, DPhil student in Richard Wade Martin's lab. And it sort of tries to address the question of why should we even want to? Why should we even need to model, uh, model Alzheimer's in a dish? And it sort of nicely points out that we can derive um, blood, uh, neurons from blood cells ineffectively, and we can use these. We can use these to uh, look for the effect of treatments on their morphology, on the transcriptome. We can use them as screens to try and identify therapeutics that intervene with those, uh, with those pathways. And in the end, try and give us something that will intervene on the pathogenic process of Alzheimer's. So that's why we need a model in a dish. But why do we need a human cellular model? So it may strike you as blindingly obvious, but actually mice and humans are different. But they're different in really important ways. And considering how dominant rodent models have been, both in vivo and in vitro, it's important to sort of try and assess what those differences are and why we therefore need to have human cellular models. First of all, brain size. Clearly, there's about a thousandfold difference between that of a mouse a brain and a human brain. The number of neurons as well is about a thousandfold difference, 70 million versus 86 billion. Real difference is the number of connections, the number of synapses, about a billion in rodents and 100 trillion in the human. The actual transcriptome, the actual gene readout, if you like, of the aging brain is quite species specific. I'm not trying to say it's completely different, but there are important differences there. And one of those differences, if you look beneath that, and if you look at the gene regulatory networks, in other words, the architecture, the control architecture that actually says, right, what gene is being expressed where and when. And if you look as a proxy for that and look at where transcription factor binding sites actually bind, then they're quite different between the two species. And again, that difference is not that there's no overlap, it's just the significant differences. And one of the really interesting things is if you look at the hominid specific differences, they're really associated with genes associated with higher functions, such as memory, uh, neurological pathways. And when you consider the dominance of those pathways in Alzheimer's, that's a really important difference. The physical uh, attributes and neuronal size, the complexity of the dendritic tree, the actual protein composition of the synapses, all this is species specific difference. It actually leads to a speed difference in the rate at which synaptic information is transferred. 
So these are good reasons for wanting a human model. So what I want to do is try and point out the significant developments that have allowed us to improve the cellular models of the user. And as an insight into that, I'm just giving you this time series here. Now, these are what I regard as the most significant revolutionary techniques that have really changed the way we do things in biology and their impact on how we make cellular models of Alzheimer's. The dates here do not refer to the discovery. The dates refer to their recognition in terms of the Nobel Prize, which has been given for them. Back in 93, PCR. Why was PCR so important? It allowed us to amplify really small amounts of DNA and clone them. It changed the whole way we did molecular cloning. Things became possible that weren't possible before. Obviously, the Human Genome Project was one of the greatest advances it was. It gave us a playbook of the entire sequence, of most of the entire sequence of the human genome. That really enabled us to make manipulations and see the effect on a whole genome level rather than by gene by gene. About another 10 years later, then we had the uh, introduction of induced pluripotent stem cells, which I'll talk about shortly. About another 10 years later, then we have gene editing, an exquisite tool for making fine changes to the genome. And I think if I'm gonna sort of look in the future and think, well, where are we gonna be in 10 years time? I think it will be a recognition of the importance of AI of machine learning in, in drug design. So whether a 2030 Nobel Prize goes to an inventor of an algorithm or whether it goes to the algorithm, I remain agnostic on that issue. So how has that changed the way we do things? Well, what we used to do, by that I mean, say when I was actually an experimentalist, when I was a postdoc, we would be typified by doing small scale experiments, by which we'd be mixing A and B and see what happened. We'd have very generalized cell models, typically neuroblastomas with very little contextualization to the human condition. And we'd have limited ability to manipulate the genome. Maybe we could do a bit of uh, homologous recombination. And that was about it. And then these technology revolutions that I've just indicated, they've changed the way we do things. So now when we do what we might call an experiment is where we're looking at the interaction or the readout of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of interactions at one time. That brings in its wake a whole load of data and a requirement for analysis. And more and more, the analysis is being, if not switched, supplemented by AI approaches rather than standard methods. We can now, instead of using these neuroblastoma models, we can actually use stem cells, stem cells which are derived from individuals or individual specific stem cells. And using the gene editing, we can really very easily, quite easily, manipulate the genome at will, potentially all the multiple sites. These are game changing. That's why these three changes in technology, I think are the biggest impacts on the way we do things. If you want to state it in its simplest, it really gives us an ability to link the phenotype to the genotype, which is sort of Darwinian in its significance. So I'm going to talk about what uh, human iPS sees and what gene editing, what they've done for the, our development of cellular models of Alzheimer's. And if I don't run out of time, which I might, I'll give a very brief insight into how AI can contribute to analysis of phenotype. So let's just start with iPSCs. Uh, Shinya Yamanaka received Nobel Prize in 2012 for this, with the work he did in 2006. And at its simplest, you can take any, practically any somatic cell, typically fibroblasts from any one human, from any one of you in the audience, and you can reverse the clock and turn it back into a stem cell that is all but indistinguishable from the pluripotent stem cell of the embryo. And if anybody prior to 2006 had asked how easy a task it was, or if it asked me, I would have said it was nigh and impossible, but if it was possible, you'd need hundreds of different transcription factors to try and reverse this. It's not. For a cocktail of four factors, so-called the Yamanaka cocktail, is quite sufficient to reverse the differentiated state to the completely undifferentiated state. Why might that be important? So we take the human, we take the stem cell, we take the fibroblasts, we reprogram, we make the induced pluripotent stem cells, but what use are these? Now we start the clock going forward. Now we can differentiate these towards neural progenitors. From the neural progenitors, we can generate the neurons and the glia, and we can also from the iPSC uh, generate the microglia. You'll be hearing much more about this afternoon from Sally Cowley. So we can generate the three cardinal cell types that inhabit the brain. What do we do with these? We can look at the individual cell, cellular phenotypes, such as neural morphology. We can look at how they connect together at either an individual level or at a network level. And then we can use these as readouts to try and find drugs which will alter that. And then we can do that on different human backgrounds, leading us to drugs and therapies, leading us to try and find some mitigation for the ravages of Alzheimer's. So the second piece of technology 
gene editing. I mean, I can't believe anybody has not heard of gene editing now when it's even on Radio 4 every week, then it must be public knowledge. So this is really a way of introducing really precise edits into the genome, far more than was possible doing the old style homologous recombination. And again, this is recognized in Nobel Prize uh, in 2020 to Charpentier and Ludner. And at its simplest, what does it let us do? There's two components to it. One is the gRNA component. This is the addressing component. This is where you make a particular sequence that goes to one and one only sequence in the genome, or you hope it does. What is the usefulness of that gRNA is it now recruits Cas9, the endonuclease, which introduces a double-stranded nick on the DNA. And when you introduce a double-stranded nick on the DNA, then the cell goes about trying to repair it. The cell has two options. It can either go by the hammer approach, the blunt approach, which is the non-homologous end joining, where it simply sticks the two ends together again. And in doing so, it either throws out or throws in the odd base. In other words, you get an indel likely leading to a loss of function mutation. So if you want to kill a gene, it's a very easy way of killing a gene. The other way is to promote the uh, formation of homologous recombination where you can now say, okay, I want it to recombine that way. I want to introduce this sequence. So this is a much more precision event to do this. But it can do much more than this. And it's really been outpaced, although it still comes under the hubris of gene editing, it's been replaced largely by uh, prime editing. Prime editing will probably be replaced by something else. Now, this, instead of relying on nature to actually fill the gap in, simply means now that we've introduced a nick in the DNA, insert our own sequence into the DNA, use the nick as to actually cut the second strand of the DNA and repair it, so you get a very, very precise uh, engineering step. You can do more than this. So if you think about Cas9, it has two things it can do. One is it binds to the gRNA. Secondly, it cuts the DNA. So if you kill its ability to cut the DNA, you mutate the, uh, the, uh, the nuclear sites out, you now have a dead Cas9. And you think, well, what use is a dead Cas9? Very useful, because now you can fuse that dead Cas9 to just about anything you want. Typically, you can switch it, you can fuse it to a transcriptional activator, a transcriptional repressor, or something that's delivering a change in the epigenetic code, such as an HDAC, for instance. And now you can introduce these to any specific location. So you can dial up, you can dial down, or you can alter the local epigenome. That is a phenomenally powerful tool. Because prior to this, there were really only global ways of doing this, and we change the whole epigenome of the cell. Now we can change the local epigenome. So Cas9 is greatly matured from something that simply cuts DNA into simply an empty truck on which you can put all sorts of useful stuff. So bring this back down to modeling Alzheimer's. Now this is probably a graph familiar to anybody in Alzheimer's field. It sort of uh, graphs the uh, risk genes according to their frequency in the population, according to the risk of getting Alzheimer's if you have these. And essentially it breaks down into mutations now the presenil and presenil 2 of the APP gene these mutations are almost 100% penetrant. I mean, we can, to all intents and purposes, call them deterministic. If you have this mutation, if you have this gene, if you have this genotype, then you get the phenotype, i.e., you get Alzheimer's. And the rest of the genes, which give us the 60-70% propensity, the risk, uh, total genetic risk, or hereditary risk of getting late onset Alzheimer's, or rather more accurately, sporadic Alzheimer's, are a whole bunch of genes down here. These are only risk genes. In other words, if you have two alleles of APOE4, it does not mean you're going to get sporadic Alzheimer's, but it does raise your risk. Now, this makes different sort of impositions on any cellular model you might want to make. And there's a reasonable expectation that if you had deterministic genes such as these and introduced these into a cell, then you might get a phenotype. There is less of a reason to pre-think but if you did the same with these risk genes, that you would necessarily get a phenotype. After all, they're risk genes, they are not deterministic genes. So stated otherwise, if you have a disease with high penetrance, and we'll just stick on the familial AD with the mutations in say PCN1 or AP1, there's a reasonable expectation that you will get a cellular phenotype. But even so, most of the studies, not all the studies, uh, really in order to get the phenotype that has any meaning, they still have to push these neurons. It's not enough just to grow them by themselves. Typically, you have to do a stressor on, and typically in Alzheimer's, that stressor would be a beta oligomers. Even then, you still see variation in this. Now, some of this variation may depend on the actual phenotype that you're reading out, whether you actually need that external stressor or whether you don't need that external stressor. Well, I'll come back to that. So 
I'm going to pick on two studies, one out of Shankar Subramaniam's lab, and that's this study. And their first attempt to look at familiar Alzheimer's was not to use gene edit cells, but to take cells which carried FAD mutations and compare them with uh, age and gender match controls. And probably the most significant finding of this was if you focus just on the transcription factors and then came to a conclusion about what these transcription factors did, then you could see a rise, everything in red is a rise in pluripotency genes and cell cycle genes, inflammation genes, and in D differentiation genes. If you looked at the total change in gene expression, and then the rise in gene expression was typified by cell cycle, for instance. And if you go down to the down-regulated genes, then synaptic signaling, synapse regulation, membrane potential, synaptic plasticity. You could say all of these pathways are those associated with the differentiated product. So Shankar Subramanian's interpretation of this was if you put this on the Waddington-type landscape, you imagine a stem cell differentiates into ectoderm and into neural ectoderm from neural ectoderm, neural precursors into a neuron, that could be the typical uh, trajectory. Then uh, Shankar's interpretation is that during uh, familial Alzheimer's, you get a trans differentiation back to this other primitive state. Now, I'm not sure you can say it's a trans differentiation, but in the next slide, I'll also show you something else which sort of looks at the same thing, but the other way around. It does seem that the familiar, that the, the fad neuron, at least in the dish, is a sort of um, less mature, slightly different cell, shall we say, a slightly different cell that shows some of, exhibits some of the properties of a less differentiated neuron. And then if we look at the work uh, which came out of Lee's lab, then they did pretty much the same. In other words, they're looking at a bunch of cells which contain FAD mutations and they're comparing them to gender and uh, age match controls. And if you look at the upregulated genes here, then the upregulated genes, neuronal projection, neuronal development, axonogenesis, cell projection, organization, all those qualities which are important in establishment of the final product. And I put the emphasis on the word establishment of the final product and a decrease in genes associated with cell cycle. So this is slightly different, but where it's common is that I would say the interpretation from this paper was that the fat neurons in the dish did not differentiate in the same way as an adult, as a, a normal neuron, shall we say. So as opposed to the Shankar view, that it represented a de-differentiation, I think what they're saying, I'm putting words in their mouth, is that it really it represents a slightly different uh, developmental trajectory. So you already have a different type of neuron from the very beginning. In other words, it represents an alternative differentiation rather than a trans differentiation. What we can say in both cases is that the neurons do have a less mature phenotype. So now if we say, well, okay, that's okay. We just done sort of case, uh, case control experiments. Here. You're going to expect a certain degree of variance. Uh, variance is, is going to be due to that genotypic difference, but actually variance just because one individual is different from the other. This is the big theoretical advantage of using gene editing. You're just looking at exactly the same isogenic background with one simple uh, tweak on it. And the tweak here is exactly the same. It's in the PCN1 gene. Um, now, uh, they found this, the quantity of paper, they found a lot of differences on the cells. I'm just going to focus on one difference here. And this is where they were looking at the early endosomes marked by RAB5. And it was, you can see the consistency of the effect here, if I just focus on this figure, between the wild type and the APP mutant cells and the PCEN mutant cells in the actual ratio of the RAB5 puncture. Now, some studies show that's an increase or decrease in the numbers, some sort it's an increase or decrease in the size, but there is a defect in the endosomal signaling. And it makes sense because many of the risk genes, such as APOE itself, are concerned with uh, endocytosis. So this, uh, you could say, gives a more robust way to interrogate the background by simply using the gene editing to change one particular locus, then it's reasonable to at least make the case that the phenotype you're looking at is not due to variance between X, Y, and Z. It's the variance simply from that one gene locus. It has a beautiful, clear clinical clarity about it. There are caveats in that, but quite happy to talk about, but not at the moment. So what do we conclude from that? We know that fad neurons are distinct from their match controls. There is some consensus on the pathways which are dysregulated due to that. But there is also a lot of variance there. You even see that variance when you use gene editing, but it's much less than that. 
and you get this core set of genes, which is easier to interpret against neurodegeneration when you look at what they're controlling. They're controlling the neuro, you know, neuroactive ligand receptors, they're controlling extracellular matrix interactions, pi 3 k signaling, and the endosomal size, uh, which I mentioned earlier. These are sort of interactions and pathways which we know are disrupted in the Alzheimer's brain. So that's, that's familiar Alzheimer's. If we moved it on to uh, sporadic Alzheimer's, now we've got a problem. There isn't any particular gene that we can target at, although there is one I'm going to come back down to later, but you know it's just a total genetic load risk. So what do you do here? Well, one study is doing what, uh, what indeed we are doing as well in a parallel study, but uh, they, they took iPSCs from 53 individuals. That's already a pretty big task to do that. And then they would look for correlates between the expression profiles, between the neurons which were induced in these iPSCs and the brains of the same person. Now, to cut a long story uh, short, what they got was an association between the AB to 42-40 ratio in the iPSC neurons and that in the new and the presence of neuritic plaque, and also with the brain extracts looking at their AB 42 to 40 ratio. Now, this sort of answers something profound because right at the beginning, uh, the reason that we got into this and the reason sort of Simon Lovestone led the uh, deep and frequent phenotyping study was can we say there is a correlation between the neuron in a dish and the individual? I mean, that, that's pretty profound. If you can't answer that question, then these cells have limited use. So I don't know whether the variance on this is going to be enough to actually be diagnostic in a biomarker sort of way. But in the general terms, is there a relationship between the properties of the induced neuron and the property of the brain? We have to answer yes. How useful that difference is, I think we have to wait and see. So what can we do otherwise? Well, if we now go back and look at the biggest risk gene for sporadic Alzheimer's, that's ApoE4. And if you have the ApoE3 allele, two, Apo, two alleles of ApoE3, that's regarded as neutral. And about 78% of us in the audience probably have this. If you have one allele of E4, then you have a two to three times greater chance of getting Alzheimer's. And if you have both alleles, that's a 12 times greater chance. And actually, if you have the rare alpha-2 allele, you actually get a slight protective effect. And these are very precise differences. There's just two residues. There's either going to be a cysteine or an arginine, and all the permutations of that give rise to the different APOEs. And presumably this is going to do with the, the secondary folding of the protein. So what you can do with these, or what was done with this, was to say, all right, this is the biggest genetic risk factor for sporadic Alzheimer's. Can we treat it in the way we treat the PCM1 and APP for, for familial Alzheimer's? And the answer is yes. So you can make the gene editing from the ApoE3 to ApoE4. You can do the reverse from the ApoE4 to E3. Then you can grow neurons, astrocytes, and microglia. I have to say these are separate cultures, not co-cultures. And what they found was quite remarkable. First of all, for such a discrete editing event, the effects on the gene expression, those three uh, cell types, there's several hundred genes change in each of those cell types in response to this quite discrete editing. And the pathways down the layer were quite insightful. For instance, in astrocytes, when you uh, mutated the APOE3, the, uh, the protective to the APOE4, you got reductions in the APOE level. So, uh, sorry, uh, the other way around. Uh, you got in, in changes in cholesterol accumulation, and you got impaired clearance of the alpha beta. In the neurons, you got increased synaptosome formation, early, uh, an increase in the elevated early endosomes, which I talked about earlier, and an increase in the generation of A beta. In the microglia, then you got a more immune phenotype. They were reactive, they had impaired A beta clearance. So all of this shows you that using gene editing to focus even on a gene which is a risk gene, not a deterministic gene like APOE, you can still get a highly correlated phenotype to the genotype that has overtones of relevance to the clinical situation. So the elephants in the living room, we're growing neuro largely, we're growing neurons only in a dish. That ain't how the brain is. Uh, we're growing them fat on a dish, 2D. That ain't how the brain is. And we have taken no account of age yet. So I just want to unwrap these three compounds. So let's go back to our map of the risk genes. Sally Cowley will tell us exactly how many of these are associated with microglia, but I think about half of these are associated with, uh, with the immune function in the brain. And you can see this in the expression profile here, comparing the cortex overall with the microglia. So we cannot ignore and should not ignore and do not ignore the microglia. So what do we do about this? And again, Sally is undoubtedly going to unwrap this later. This is one of her own pictures. You can grow these cells together. 
So even if the end product of what you want to look at is the neurodegeneration, the de degeneration of the neuron, if you require the microglia there in order to see the effect, then they have to be present. So ideally, what you'd want to do is at least reconstitute the three cardinal cells of the nervous system, the astrocytes, the microglia, and the neurons, and then try and understand what's going on. Of course, you've introduced complexity. Now you've got the problem of deconvoluting that, de that complexity. Second level of complexity that you can introduce is to say, right, well, let's make little organoids, little floating, uh, floating organelles, which are really reconstitutions, if you like, of a, a cortical structure. And you can get uh, the astrocytes into this and you can get the neurons into this. I think it's going to be a bit of a challenge to get the microglia into this. Maybe it's been done. And you can see how there is some uh, sort of representation of the developmental profile. If you look after three months and you look at the number of cells which are represented by the neuron, I can't see behind my screen, but it's, and then the number which is represented by the glia is only 13.5%. Even for six months. Now, remember, the, uh, in the developing brain, you switch from a neurogenic to a gliogenic environment. So, at the later age, the number of neurons which is being produced is decreasing. You can see by the size of the blue pie, and the size represented by the glia is increasing. So, this may be a way of increasing the 3D complexity and the cellular interactions which underlie that complexity. I think it's going to be a long way before this can be translated into something that might represent a cellular or phenotypic screen, but you have to start somewhere. So what about age, the final confound? If we look at the gene expression profile of cortical neurons that de uh, developing from an iPSC, and we look at the marker of pluripotency of the induced pluripotent stem cell, then you can see a rapidly precipitated sound after a few days to almost nothing as neural induction proceeds. If you look at the marker of the neural precursors, in this case HES5, you can see it peaks and then comes down. And then this is about the point where terminal differentiation starts and you start getting neuronal production. So if we look at a marker of the glutamatergic neurons, the solute carrier 1706, then we can see a steady rise at this, which is in state at the point where neuronal differentiation begins. So what does this mean? Well, if you look at the developing profile of a real human embryo, then after about two weeks, you get the primitive streak, the first sign of any differentiation on a developing embryo. And a few days later, you get gastrulation formation of the three major, uh, well, the three cardinal germ layers. A few days later, you start getting specification of the neural plate, and then the neural plate falls into the neural fold, and then we eventually get the neural tube, and we start getting neuronal differentiation. So this is by about 60 days, which you might say is equivalent to some of the cultures we make. So in other words, what we're looking at is an embryonic neuron. So there's a challenge. If, can we look at an embryonic neuron and learn anything about neurodegeneration? And this is a challenge that's been thrown at us, by us, I mean the community, for a long time. One of my retorts to this, and it's not trivial, is, well, it's a heck of a sight better than the SHSY5 one, the neuroblastomas that you were all using 10 years ago. But the point is still well made. These are embryonic neurons, so can they model neurodegeneration? Can you do it another way? There is another way of making neurons, and this is, go is without going back in time, without going back to the embryonic stage, that embryonic stem cell. And this is called direct induction. And there are a bunch of cocktails by which you can take a fibroblast and you can make it into this induced neuron. And by switching the cocktails, you can even make or favor the uh, type of neuron you get. So you can favor the conditions using NER1 and LMX1A to get dopaminergic neurons, or you can even get serotonergic neurons if you increase, if you use uh, FOXA2 and LMX1B. So you think, okay, this is the way to go. And there is good reason to think that these do age. I mean, a lot of this has been pioneered by Fred Gage as, as much in this field. And the cells do appear to be much more aged than their iPSC counterparts. And the interesting point is if you say, well, what is aging? It's a really interesting question because there are many ways you can try and induce aging in a dish, which really comes down to throwing different insults onto the cells. It's not quite clear what their pathophysiological relevance is and they're all quite different. Uh, the sort of things which they do find is they do find a defect, uh, a decrease in the transport between the cytoplasm and the nucleus. You get some loss of the genome integrity, which is no doubt to do with the increase in reactive oxygen species and the DNA oxidation that's happening, increases in stress response manifest in the mitochondria, uh, decreased telomere length, and DNA methylation. One note on DNA methylation, this is great. So you may think you know how old you are, but if you actually look at your chronological age along here, 
And then if you look at the readouts of your biological age, obviously the bulk of people somewhere along this line, but you get some people who are chronologically say 70 years old, but they have a biological age, maybe of 30 or 40, and the vice versa, some people age uh, prematurely. And the most robust indicator of biological age as opposed to chronological age is your epigenome. You get an increase uh, across the whole of the genome in, meth in, in well, a decrease in methylation, but you get some local places where there's hypermethylation. And this signature reflects biological age. Uh, so what use is that? What it does mean, if we try and induce aging processes in the cell in order to make our embryonic neurons more aged, then at least we have a readout that means something rather than the relatively arbitrary means of looking at aging. We can actually look at the epigenetic, at their epigenetic status. So is it going to be an induced neuron or an iPSC neuron? I think this is no brain at some extent. The cell of origin, there's mainly fibroblasts in the induced neurons. Practically any cell can be reprogrammed for making iPSC neurons. If we look at the scalability, there's not much prospect of induced neuron. You start with the plate of fibroblasts, you turn them into neurons. At that point, the post mitotic, there's no amplification of population. That's pretty limited amplification. Whereas you can get almost unlimited um, amplification of iPSCs prior to their neuronal differentiation. I've already mentioned the biological age of the neuron. In the induced neurons, it reflects the donor, whereas in the IPSC neuron, it really sort of reflects the length of time of being in culture. They are embryonic. The developmental trajectory. This may be less important for neurodegeneration, where the first um, approximation, all they bothered about is having the mature cell. But if you're interested, for instance, in looking at ASD or schizophrenia, developmental disorder, you might want to have that neuron where you've got, have gone to a pseudo normal way of, uh, of development that approximates what happens in vivo. That's not the case uh, in induced neurons. Marginality, they're totally non-clonal. Uh, that's always going to produce batch effects and variants, whereas in the IPSC, they're clonal. Uh, I talked about the neurodegeneration phenotype. I'll give you one example, not from Alzheimer's, but from Huntington. And that uh, if you use induced neurons uh, from a mutant hunting background, then you can actually show that you can get the mutant hunting aggregates in the cytoplasm and the subsequent impaired prote proteostasis. If you do that from an IPSC neuron, then <clears throat> you don't really have much change, yet, but you, you need, again, to put this external stressor on, like whether this is a, uh, you know, a really a proxy of age or not, we don't know. So those are the essential differences, but I think the argument comes down in favor of IPSC neurons every time. Maybe induced neurons, directly induced neurons can produce some validation system. But for all the problems with the lack of age in the IPSC neurons, it's hard to actually see the advantages of induced neurons. Last point, I still got five minutes. Yeah, yeah. cool. All right, so I did say I would give one uh, insight into why artificial intelligence is revolutionizing biology. And this is going to be a fairly low level example uh, from, from our lab, but nevertheless, it gives you some idea of what you can do. So a typical assay, say a synaptic assay that we're using as a screen to find the drugs that may increase or decrease synaptic activity might consist of making neurons, treating with uh, compounds prior to your insult, the beta treatment, and then staining for neurites, synaptic proteins. And then how do you analyze it? So you put this through a high content uh, imaging system, and then you will get various readouts of uh, numbers of features, exactly 100 features, but it's, it's essentially supervised learning. You are telling it uh, what you want to look at. And then you get a hit compound out and cure Alzheimer's, go home, be famous and rich. However, so this might be, well, this not might be what it looks like. This, this is what it looks like. If we look at the neuritic area, or if we look at synapse count, two proxies for what's happening when we add A beta, then you can see between control and, and the increasing doses of A beta, then you get a significant effect of some doses. It's better with the synapse count. You get a decrease, and you can see that the decrease is related to the dose of A beta. And this might be <clears throat> a typical experiment where we did it a few years ago, where in fact many people still do it. But what is interesting is if instead of actually using supervised learning as you get through the high content system, is if you take the raw images and subject them to a machine learning approach, which is totally unsupervised. Machine learning doesn't have to be unsupervised, but in this case, it is unsupervised. You're not telling it what to look at. Just say, go away and learn this, just like facial recognition software. In fact, most of the algorithms which come out of this have their origins in facial recognition software. And you give it a task. Can you tell the difference between a cell treated with A, or beta, and not? Uh, this is the simply confusion matrix, the difference between the actual and what's read out. 
and you can see that the accuracy is 99.6%. You can even use salience mapping because a lot of people would say, the problem with AI is you don't know what's under the hood. It's not true. You can actually say, well, what bits of information is the algorithm taking most notice of? When it comes to analyzing visual information, the unit of information is a pixel. So you can see where it's actually looking at. It seems to be looking at not the cell bodies, but the neuritic tree. I don't think that has tremendous value, but you can see that you can start to extract information. But I think the real value of this is, uh, it is, as I said here, super accurate, 99.6%. But it does this on one plate in, 16 sec in 60 seconds, one minute. The amount of time taken under conventional analysis on high content imaging is 15 hours. It's a tremendous uh, increase in um, speed and efficiency. But this is early work. What we can do is also use it to identify differences in very subtle genotypes of cells in a way that we can't actually see any differences when we use high content imaging to do it. So it's not just speed and efficiency, it's a, it is the acuity of it, its ability to recognize those subtle changes that distinguish between either a genotype, in this case, disease genotype, or between drug treatment. So it's not just sort of doing it for speed, although when it comes down to translation to a screen, speed is a really important feature. So I started by saying, how far have we come? So let me summarize. We can generate iPSCs specific to you, to anybody, with relative ease. We can use these iPSCs to generate the neural and the non-neural cells. They're immature, but nevertheless, they do model many features that are associated with neurodegeneration. We can introduce 3D to recapitulate the physical complexity of the brain. We can measure the cellular molecular correlates in neurodegeneration, and we can use gene editing to produce isogenic cells. This, the isogenic background is a really good thing, but if you have a complex disease due to um, many different genes, it's still going to be a challenge. So that's where we've probably come. So where do we need to go? We need to massively increase the scale of production of iPSCs. Um, there is no way that it can be sort of a one student's project to make one at one IPSC, one edit, and to spend three or four years sweating on that. Many of you in this audience may have done that. I don't know my sympathies to you if you have. We need to get into robotics. We need to get into producing these at scale. Uh, this is going on. It's, they're going on partially in Oxford as well. We need to be able to produce thousands, maybe tens of thousands of IPSCs at a time. If we produce thousands, then we actually need to be able to analyze thousands. And I think the obvious way forward, I think it's fairly obvious anyway, is if we're going to do transcriptomics as a readout of this, we need to do two things. They need to be single cell transcriptomics. And we need to be able to put, say, 100, 1,000 cells in the same dish. That gets rid of all the batch effects. Everything's being treated the same. Then the problem is, how do you distinguish which transcriptome comes from which cell? This can be done. This is routine. We can do this barcoding, where each of the cells at the beginning has a barcode or a unique molecular identifier. This comes out in the sequencing run, so you can associate the sequence to the cell type, the cell type to the genotype. So this is a way, potentially, of going forward and analyzing the readout on a transcription level of thousands of cells at a time. Uh, there are emerging technologies. We always talk about RNA-seq because the RNA is something we can analyze at depth. We can analyze pretty much the whole of that. Whereas when it comes to proteome, although it, in a sense it's obviously more intuitive, it's the proteins that are doing the business, nevertheless, it's really hard to actually get single cell proteomics. But that is changing. <clears throat> and again, not least because of efforts at Oxford in single cell uh, label-free proteomics, where I think uh, from conversations even just yesterday, it's to the point of where from a single cell, you may be able to get a readout of about 1,500 to 4,000 different proteins. It's not that far behind what you get with single cell RNA-seq. This, this is a technology we really need to keep strong tabs on. We need to improve the protocols for the co-cultures of neurons and astrocytes and microglia. And Sally has led on this, and no doubt, again, we'll be talking about this later. We must have these co-cultures. Just to reiterate what I said before, even if the final endpoint is the degeneration of the neuron, if it is the endocytic response or the immune response of the, uh, of the microglia, the astrocytes necessary, they have to be there. And we have to be able to distinguish between them. Hand in hand with that, we can look more at organoid production, but that needs a significant improving in the robustness of the protocols. There is a huge amount of variation at the moment. Where there's a huge amount of variation, that limits the amount that you will see due to either genotype or perturbation. Variation is the enemy. We must make use of deep learning and, uh, well, I guess for any form of machine learning, but deep learning specifically to classify the cellular phenotype and develop the screens for small molecules that can switch phenotype. So having given that 
resume of where we've been and where we are, then I think don't focus too much on the negative because I think iPSCs to model neurodegeneration, to model Alzheimer's is still the best tool we've ever had in the toolbox. And hopefully it will allow us to go down this cascade where we take our most cherished asset, which is uh, our human knowledge, where we take our population. We have huge access of electronic medical records. <coughs> Excuse me. We have huge Im imaging resources, we have huge genetics resources. From these individuals, we can make the IPSCs, we can use the genome editing, we can apply this to screening, we can use this to identify either genes and the pathways that are responsible for the phenotype, and hopefully we can discover small molecules that reverse or block that. Yeah, got a question. Thank you. And also thank you for pointing out this difference between the field of sufficient information after the screen practice. I think more people would that. Yeah. I just wonder if you can comment on how does this role in the CC or CD work? Yeah. Like the models that you're No, it's, it's really important. So there was pointing out the difference between the mouse and the human, but I think particularly those high end um, readouts, particularly concerned with sound connectivity in networks. I think there's less known at those levels. The bulk of papers have really been just looking at, say, can it conduct a, a, an action potential? Can it uh, produce a synapse? But that higher level about synaptic conductivity, it's going to be hard to assess because how long do we leave, leave the neurons in order for them to be so mature that we can actually say, does that connectivity reflect the connectivity quoted there, which is from the adult brain, of course. So I think it's, um, if it's known, I don't know the answer, but I think it's probably not known because you would need such a mature set of cultures to be able to make that comparison. But at least we could potentially compare like with like and compare human cultures with murian cultures, for instance. But uh, I couldn't comment on whether that's been done or not. And one, one more. Yeah. You may have to just speak out loudly. And, and do you mind just um, yeah. repeating it for everybody else to get an idea? Okay, given the importance of uh, growth factors in the, well, certainly in the milieu of the brain, in the, in the requirement, for instance, your BDNF being required for striatal neurons, for instance, uh, and we have growth uh, hormones as, as, as part of the culture medium, the dish. Um, is this the optimal way for actually being able to see the disease difference? I mean, I, I could apply that to any component of the of the cocktail. It's an approximate emulation often of what the development of decisions are. But saying, are these the right conditions? You, you sort of have to bear in mind why these conditions are what they are. They're conditions which have been empirically derived to give optimal growth. They're not necessarily conditions which have been a priori designed to recapitulate that of the brain. They often recapitulate qualitatively, so like if we need GDNF, we put GDNF in. But trying to find the optimal concentration, make a comparison between in vivo and vitro, I don't think that's how it's been done. It's been done for a pragmatic reason, that that keeps the cells alive. Um, whether we see, um, so I guess the real essence of your question is, given that there might be variants there, um, how much can we actually rely upon that to see proper pathological differences? Um, it's, a, <laughs> it's a great question. I don't think we know. I think that is just possibly one of the variables we, we throw into it. And we won't know until we've actually continued through to the end and find whether we can discover meaningful processes. But in defense of it, I would say that when you compare uh, the transcriptomes, say of cortical neurons, for instance, uh, and you compare that to the adult brain uh, counterpoints, and if you do that with uh, FAD neurons and compare that to AD brain, obviously it's not one for one. I don't think you should be looking at gene for gene. It's really the overlying processes. And there's quite a, a significant congruence, I think, between the overall processes for regulators. So I think there's plenty to justify at that sort of rather top level that there is a fearful recapitulation between in vitro and vivo. But I think at a final level where it may depend on such, such things as you mentioned, the concentration of growth factor, we'll have to wait and see, but there's not much we can do about altering those concentrations without altering the viability of the system. Okay, we're gonna have to end it there. Thank okay. you so much. Norman. Yeah. Uh, let me just see.
Okay, and our second speaker in this symposium is um, Sana Suri, who is an Alzheimer's Society Research Fellow here. Sana's done uh, a PhD work on APOE, as well as the neurovascular problems that might be associated with dementia. And today she's gonna to be looking at this uh, question about can we prevent dementia and the challenges that we have and the ways forward. Thank you, Sana. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to Masood and Nick for giving us the chance to do this live. Uh, it's very exciting to be here. And hello everyone, I'm Sana Suri, and I lead the Heart and Brain Group in the Department of Psychiatry at the Warnford Hospital. Um, and today I'm gonna to talk to you about current challenges in prevention and what we're doing in Oxford to try and tackle some of these questions. So I wanna start out with one of my uh, favorite statistics about the aging population. It's predicted that half of all babies born after the year 2000 in Western Europe will live to celebrate their 100th birthday. Um, and this is really exciting, but at the same time, we also become more mindful of age associated illnesses, the most common being dementia. Um, and uh, you know, soon we're gonna see more people aged over 65 in our population than under 15. Um, and so that, then we start to think about how uh, dementia prevalence um, is, going to, is going to affect uh, the quality of life as we get older. So what is dementia? Um, very broadly speaking, it's an umbrella term that talks about progressive worsening of memory, decision making, attention, language, uh, reasoning, um, and there are many causes of dementia, but the most common cause is Alzheimer's disease. Um, there's also vascular dementia, Lewy body, and frontotemporal dementia as well. Now, like I said, the prevalence of dementia is set to rise. So every three seconds, someone in the world develops dementia. And this is a really, really sort of hard hitting statistic to sit with, um, especially given the fact that this number is expected to triple in the next 30 years. So we're going to see um, about 130 million people worldwide living with some form of dementia. And again, it's sort of difficult to digest the statistic given that um, in the last 20 years, um, about 99% of clinical trials into Alzheimer's disease have failed. And we're going to talk a little bit more about why that is in a second. Now, each of the dementias that I mentioned earlier, uh, they present with hallmark pathology in the brain. So with Alzheimer's, we've got the amyloid and tau aggregates. With FTD, you've got PIC cells. With Lewy body, you've got the Lewy body uh, aggregates in the brain. These pathologies, they also have a very characteristic progression. So amyloid starts um, in the neocortex, the hippocampus, and spreads out to the rest of the brain. Tau starts again in the enterorhinal regions and the locus ceruleus, and then spreads out. Um, and Lewy bodies start in the brainstem, moving up to the basal ganglia, and then to the rest of the brain as the diseases, as the diseases progress. The diseases also present with hallmark symptoms. So um, in Alzheimer's disease, uh, the, the sort of very broadly speaking, the earliest symptom is memory loss, starts with MCI, moving on to mild, moderate and severe Alzheimer's as the disease progresses. Uh, with Lewy body dementia, based on where the pathology starts, you do see motor symptoms early on. And again, that progresses um, into cognitive symptoms as the disease progresses. With FTD, depending on which variant of FTD you have, you can have changes in social conduct, impulsivity, apathy, um, language problems, and so on. In addition to the hallmark pathology and the symptomology, there's also hallmark signatures on an MRI. So with vascular dementia, um, this is what you would typically see. So you have these large white lesions in the brain, um, which are called white matter hyperintensities that you see on this kind of scan called a flare scan. With FTD, as the name suggests, you see atrophy in the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. And in Alzheimer's disease, you see changes in the hippocampus. Um, so at the bottom panel here, you've got um, scans from a patient with Alzheimer's disease, and you see a lot more black around the hippocampus. And that is indicative of atrophy in, in that region compared to a person with healthy um, aging. So if it's all that simple, if you've got these different dementias, which have a very characteristic pathology, characteristic symptomology, characteristic MRI signatures, um, then that must make diagnosis really very easy, right? Um, but it's not that clear cut. Uh, patients are often in reality diagnosed with more than one type of dementia, unspecified dementia, or 
in some cases even misdiagnosed. And this is uh, data from the Danish uh, National Patient Registry uh, recently, where they found that the most common diagnosis uh, out of their 7 million patients in this registry was unspecified dementia. And that about 200,000 people were, were given diagnosis of more than one subtype. Um, and like I said, misdiagnosis is also a problem. So you've got um, people presenting with motor symptoms and Lewy body dementia, which often get confused with Parkinson's disease or Parkinsonism as well. So this obviously has implications for treatment. So uh, let's say someone sort of comes to the clinic in the UK with memory problems. What's the usual streamline um, for them to be able to get a diagnosis? So you here in the country, you go to your GP, the GP will refer you for a scan. Often this is a CT scan. Um, the, the radiologist will look at the report of the scan and send the report to the memory clinic. Um, and then uh, your memory clinic will do a few more tests, looking at your family history and more cognitive tests, and then give you a diagnosis and then discharge you and follow up um, within the next year. Now, the NICE guidelines say that that imaging scan that, that patients are supposed to get to help with diagnosis, um, the preferred modality is MRI, um, and that's magnetic res resonance imaging. Um, but, you know, they also say CT scanning could be used, and depending on where you are in the country, you can get various different types of scans to assist with the diagnosis. So, you know, depending on which NHS trust you're, uh, you're seeing, you could get no brain scan uh, to assist with diagnosis. You could get standard uh, practice, which is a CT scan, which is sort of a low contrast scan. And really what you can tell from this scan is that, okay, this brain, it looks normal for age, um, or there's some temporal lobe atrophy. You could get the best practice according to the NICE guidelines, which is a, an MRI scan. And so here you get a better contrast, spatial contrast, so you can sort of look at the different parts of the brain a little bit more clearly. Um, and you can perform some sort of visual rating. So you can look at a scan and uh, say, okay, this hippocampus, the atrophy level is about a, uh, about a one or a three, uh, depending on the Shelton score or white matter hyperintensity visual rating using the Fizeka score. And these are sort of qualitative um, readings. Or you could go to a specialist clinic. And in this case, you can extract more quantitative measures um, of brain region. So you could look at the hippocampal volume, compare it to a normalized hippocampal volume uh, for the population and say, okay, this patient has a smaller hippocampus than other patients, other people who are of the same age and same sex in this population. So you can have a more informed uh, reading there. Or in rare cases, you could also go to a research clinic. So you don't just get structural MRI, you get a whole different uh, you know, bunch of MRI scans looking at diffusion, perfusion, uh, resting state fMRI, and all of these different scans, they tell you more than just about volumes. They also tell you about connectivity of the brain, microstructure of the brain, uh, blood flow in the brain, and so on. So that's the sort of range of, of diagnostic practice in the UK for brain imaging. Now, let's say you've got a patient who's come into the clinic, they've got a diagnosis of um, Alzheimer's disease. What's the next stage? Well, currently, there are a few treatments that are available for late onset Alzheimer's disease, um, and these are acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Um, you also have an NMDA receptor antagonist that's available. Um, and these are drugs that they don't slow down the progression of the disease, but they do provide some symptomatic relief. Um, so there's at the moment no drug that is disease modifying or a cure. And I put a little star up there just to indicate the fact that recently, just this year in June 2021, the FDA approved a new drug at your home using the accelerated approval pathway. Um, and everyone was really excited because this was the first clinical, first drug to pass through approval since 2003. So it's been sort of a breakthrough capturing all the headlines and all the news outlets everywhere. Um, and after all the excitement, then people sat down with the decision and looked at, okay, why did it go through the accelerated approval? And it has been hailed as a little bit of a controversial dis decision at the moment because of the two phase three clinical trials um, in this, uh, using this drug, only one of them met their primary endpoint and the other one did not. But this drug has been shown to be effective at clearing amyloid across both the, both the phase three clinical trials. So there is some promise here and some reason to be excited for sure. 
but but this drug aside you know we have not had a success like this in the last 20 years and because of that many drug companies pharma companies they are pulling out of funding alzheimer's disease clinical trials and and this is sort of really hard hitting especially in light of the statistics that i showed you earlier the fact that we are all getting older we're living longer and dementia is is a real concern so um why are clinical trials failing? And I wanna sort of, there are many, many reasons and we can do discussions on this for weeks, but I wanna think about three main things today. So the first thing for this reasons of, you know, the, fa the high failure rate of clinical trials is that many of them have focused on amyloid. Um, but what we do know now is that Alzheimer's disease is extremely complex. It's multifactorial, and depending on which research group you talk to, they will all hail a different hypothesis as being the most important hypothesis that will cure Alzheimer's disease. Um, so it could be tau, uh, amyloid, inf inflammation, cholesterol, oxidative stress, mitochondria, vascular. Um, I mean, the, the list goes on and on. And, and the reality of it is that they're all playing an important role in, in the disease cascade and they all interact, they all work together. And so what we need to be doing uh, going forward is to be thinking about more diverse trial targets, so thinking beyond amyloid. Um, and this here is just a really complex graph to show you um, sort of what goes wrong in Alzheimer's disease and how you start from risk and end up with amyloid pathology. And really, I'm not gonna spend time talking about it, but what I want you to take away from it is that it is all very complex, that there are feedback loops, it's not a linear cascade, um, things happen that cause other things to happen that then cause the first thing to happen with more effect and so on. And so there's a lot here at stake. And so what are we doing in Oxford to try and diversify trial targets? Well, we heard a little bit uh, about the deep and frequent phenotyping study. So this is a study um, that's running across eight sites in the UK and Oxford is one of them. And here what they're doing is as the name suggests, patients are coming in and getting extremely uh, deep phenotype typing. So what that means is that they're, we're getting measures from MRI, amyloid PET, amyloid tau, MEG, EEG, CSF, blood markers, gait markers, retinal imaging. So, you know, with my colleagues here, they're looking not just at established biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease, but also things that we think could be good markers, but haven't really been thoroughly tested yet. And as the name suggests, it's frequent as well. So the patients that are coming into this study, they're going to be phenotyped uh, about six times um, in, the, in the year. So they're going to be collecting a different combination of all of these markers across six follow-up visits, which is uh, or six or eight, which is very, um, which is very, very frequent for that time period. And so, you know, we hope that this will give us some more insights into more diverse trial targets. And this is a study that's ongoing. So, so sort of watch the space. The second thing that I wanted to talk about, which is misdiagnosis. Um, so in Alzheimer's disease clinical trials, there was a study that went back to pool some of these trials together. And once the participants of the trials had died, they performed a post-mortem analysis of the brain to look at the pathology. And what they found was that 22% of trial participants across these many different trials did not have amyloid in their brain to match their diagnosis of probable Alzheimer's disease. So they were testing amyloid treatments on people who did not have amyloid pathology. So of course, there's going to be a high failure rate. And so one of the things we need to think about then is how can we improve diagnosis of participants to make sure they're being streamlined into the correct clinical trials? Um, and so one of the ways we are doing this in Oxford is with my colleagues who are working over at the Brain Health Center Clinic. And this is at the One Foot Hospital at the Oxford Center for Human uh, Brain Imaging, OBA. Um, and what's happening here is if you remember the, the slide that I showed you about the different brain scans that you could get based on where you are, um, what, the thing that they're trying to do here is have that last one, which is the research um, scan. So have all the different types of MRI scans that could help inform what, disease, what uh, diagnosis the patient might have. So patients who uh, go to their GP, get referred for a brain scan. In this case, they will come to Oxford and get this sort of a very detailed structural MRI scan. And if they consent, they also get very detailed cognitive tests and a whole bunch of different MRI scans that could help inform that report of what their diagnosis might be. So we're hoping in the long run that this is going to improve differential diagnosis and help streamline particip 
participants or patients into the right trials. Um, and so this is sort of fantastic work that's been done by my colleagues, Professor Claire McKay and team, um, and they set this up during the pandemic, which is just fantastic and it's been going strong since then. And the third thing that I wanted to talk about today, which is that we're timing these trials apparently incorrectly. So what we're, a lot of these trials, they're targeted at a stage of the disease when a lot of the damage to the brain has already happened. And at this point is irreversible. So it makes these treatments a little bit redundant at this late stage. And so really one of the things we need to be doing going forward is thinking about earlier interventions and thinking about how we can target people who are at a risk of developing dementia, but don't have the symptoms yet and how we can try and slow down the progression of the pathology before the symptoms appear. So this is a very sort of hallmark jack curve um, of Alzheimer's uh, progression. And in the bottom, you've got time. On the y-axis, you've got a different range of biomarkers. And you can see in the green is when cognition starts to, uh, cognitive symptoms start to appear. Um, but if you move back along the curve, you see purple uh, represents changes in CSF amyloid, um, uh, red represent changes in PET amyloid, um, and then you've got CSF tau, and then you've got here MRI changes in the brain. So a lot of these changes can be picked up before dementia clinical symptoms appear. So can we go further back along this curve and target people in these earlier stages? This here is an updated curve um, that was uh, produced in this most recent paper in 2016, where they looked not just at these few biomarkers, but at a whole range of biomarkers. And essentially the take home message here is that what they found was that the earliest change in the brain was blood flow. And blood flow disturbances was the earliest thing that predicted conversion from early MCI to late MCI to Alzheimer's disease. Um, so understanding risk becomes really important. So again, we've heard a little bit about this. What are the risk factors for sporadic late onset Alzheimer's? The best established genetic risk factor is ApoE4. So a quarter of us in the population will have at least one copy of E4. Some of us will have the protective E2 uh, and most of us will be homozygous for E3. But there are also a whole bunch of lifestyle risk factors, which again, we heard a little bit about in an earlier talk. Um, and we've seen now um, that about 40% of ca dementia cases worldwide could in theory be prevented by modifying these risk factors. And I've put a little heart symbol on the ones that we know are also established risk factors for heart disease. So we know that there is this overlap between risk for Alzheimer's or risk for dementia and risk for heart disease. These are also vascular risk factors. And this sort of risk it's important to understand it because it is modifiable and we can intervene to try and reduce our risk or to delay the onset of dementia as we get older. But then there are some sort of questions that arise as well. We have seen studies do exercise trials, statin trials, antihypertensive trials, diet interventions, um, but so far these have only produced sort of inconclusive results at best or mild to modest effects um, in, in, in co for cognitive outputs. So why is that? Why are these prevention trials also not giving us that much um, sort of uh, as much of an intervention as we would expect? Well, it could be that we're timing them wrong, but there are also many other questions that can need to be asked about prevention as well. And this is where my research group focuses. So we look at trying to understand exactly how these risk factors affect the brain, when in the lifespan these risk factors begin to affect the brain, and looking at ways to be able to predict who is likely to develop dementia so we can then intervene and, and sort of move them or target them into clinical trials. So those are the questions that, that my research group asks. And I'm going to try and answer some of these questions today now with uh, this study, the Whitehall 2 imaging study. And you may have heard of this. Um, this is a study that was set up in 1985 at UCL. Um, and it was uh, initially uh, recruiting 10,000 British civil servants from the 80s into this cohort. And uh, they have been followed up since the 1980s um, across several waves, which are shown in black here. And at every wave marked in black, they've had very detailed vascular risk assessments, cognitive assessments, medical history, and all of that. So from when they were about 47, um, mean age, and it's still ongoing at the moment. So they're now all retired. 
In the green wave here, about 800 of them came to Oxford to get a very detailed brain scan and a whole bunch of other cognitive tests as well. And in the orange here is, um, I'm currently leading the second time point of imaging for this cohort. Um, this has stopped because of the pandemic, but we're hoping to restart it in the next month or so. And what we're doing here is repeating a lot of the baseline scans, but adding in some cool new vascular imaging scans as well. So the, the data that I'm gonna show you now focuses up to the green wave, right? So a whole bunch of lifestyle measures from their entire midlife span and then ending in a brain scan. So one of the questions we were interested in was looking at how this cardiovascular risk in midlife, so the, all of those vascular risk factors that I talked about, obesity, smoking, hypertension, cholesterol, diabetes, that were in that little graph in the earlier slide, how they contribute to brain health. So we measured vascular risk at five time points using a risk score called Framingham Risk Score, and that combines all of these measurements um, into one metric for each person to predict your likelihood of developing heart disease. And at the end of that, they had a brain scan. And what we were interested in asking is that how does total vascular risk during this entire 20 year period affect blood flow to the brain as they get older? And when in this 20 year period does the risk start becoming important? And this is what we found. So I'm just gonna keep it quite big picture here, but essentially what we found was that people with higher total vascular risk had lower blood flow to the brain in all of the regions that are shown in yellow at the top. So it's pretty widespread effect. So high vascular risk leads to low blood flow um, or is associated with low blood flow rather. And then when we asked when, which um, measurement of risk at which age was important, we found that at age 48, their risk already explained a lot of this total effect. So already at age 48, the vascular risk was associated with, with blood flow to the brain um, in older ages. And interestingly, what we noted was that the later measurements of vascular risk at 68, so closest to the brain scan, were not really associated with blood flow to the brain. So what this is telling us is that interventions that are aimed at reducing our vascular risk, so cardiovascular interventions, perhaps need to be timed much earlier on in our lifespan, in the 30s and in the 40s, because that's probably when they're going to be most effective. So in, in following studies, we were interested in sort of looking at this heart-brain relationship in a little bit more detail. So, what, so the, here, what we looked at was the blood vessel called the aorta, and you must have heard of this. This is the largest blood vessel in the body. It eventually comes, up, comes out of the heart and feeds the brain. Um, and the aorta, as we get older, it gradually gets stiffer. But in Alzheimer's disease, it, that, it's, it's sort of, that stiffness is more pronounced. And so what we were interested in asking was that does faster rate of stiffening of the aorta during this midlife period also affect the brain um, in old age. And so we had two measurements of arterial stiffness in this cohort at 63 and 68. And again, here is a many, many brains in this slide, but really what I want you to take away from this is that what we found was that people who had faster rates of stiffening of the aorta in their 60s um, had multiple measures of brain, um, uh, more brain health that were affected. So here we looked at measures of white matter microstructure, um, which are basically called diffusivity and fractional anisotropy. And you don't need to know the details at this stage, but essentially what they're telling you are sort of proxy markers for axonal health and myelin health in the brain. And what they're telling us is that people with faster rates of stiffening had um, low measures of these microstructural um, markers. And they also had lower blood flow to the brain. So again, here we're able to form sort of more direct inferences between heart health and brain health. And then most recently, my students, so this is a paper that's currently coming out in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, here we were interested in how all of these lifestyle measures and cognitive measures across the lifespan affect um, small vessel disease burden in the brain, so SVD. And what is small vessel disease? We looked at it with a few different markers, um, white matter hyperintensities, which were those lesions in the scans that I showed you earlier, those white lesions microbleeds, lacoons, and perivascular spaces. And again, I'm not gonna go into the details, but we essentially grouped people into scores of zero to three. So zero means they had none of these markers of SPD, and three means they had at least three, so three or four markers. And what we asked was how um, lifestyle and cognition relate to these, uh, the burden of uh, SPD as you get older. And, and what we found was that people in the high SPD burden group, so that's shown by the red line here, 
um, they started out with much higher blood pressure compared to the low SVD burden groups 25 years before their scan. So again, in midlife, your blood pressure determines or is associated with uh, your SVD burden in the brain 25 years later. People with high SVD also had faster rates of cognitive decline across a, a few cognitive tests, looking at fluency and verbal reasoning. And people with higher SVD burden in the brain also had other markers of brain deterioration. So lower gray matter density, including um, in the frontal regions and the hippocampus. And like I told you earlier, lower measures of white matter microstructural health measured with diffusion imaging. Now, this is all about the sort of lifestyle um, changes, right? How does uh, modifiable risk affect the brain? In my group, we're also interested in how genetic risk affects the brain. So in this study, we looked at a marker called cerebrovascular reactivity. And this, this process, cerebrovascular reactivity, CVR, is the brain's ability to dilate its blood vessels and boost up blood flow to the brain whenever there is a higher demand for energy. And we measure it, uh, one of the ways we measure it is by having participants go into an MRI scanner, breathe air with higher levels of carbon dioxide than normal. Um, and that sort of simulates this energy demand. And then we're able to see how well their blood flow response uh, increases in response to the CO2. So in people who are healthy, you would see a large increase in blood flow. And in patients with Alzheimer's disease, you see that this response is not as strong, which means that their ability to balance uh, supply and demand of energy is not um, as, as, as it should be. And here we asked whether there are similar impairments in CVR in young people, so in their 20s and 30s, who have this risk gene for, Apple, uh, for Alzheimer's. And what we found was that actually, yes, even at, in, at a mean age of 25 in this sample, you find sort of very um, large and widespread changes in uh, CVR in people with E4. So here you see uh, E4 carriers had lower CVR compared to E2, which is the protective allele. They had lower CVR compared to E3, which is again in all the regions shown in yellow. And we also extracted measures specifically from the hippocampus, which is a region of interest in Alzheimer's disease first affected. And we see again, this sort of stepwise decrease in CVR going from the highest measures in the low risk groups to the lowest measures in the high risk groups. So this again tells you that APOE is doing something in the brain, um, you know, decades before any cognitive symptoms begin to appear. So our work has essentially shown risk factors can have effects on perfusion, gray matter, white matter, brain vasculature, and they begin to affect the brain um, much earlier than one would think. So it, you can sort of have measurable changes uh, in early to midlife, perhaps even younger. So with the last question, can we predict dementia? So this is recent work that we presented at the Alzheimer's Association conference this year. And my postdoc, Melis, she looked at um, developing a new dementia risk score using the UK Biobank cohort. And you may be familiar with this cohort. This is as close to a population cohort as you can get. So there are 500,000 people in the UK who come in for cognitive tests um, and a medical history and so on. And we've uh, taken 200,000 of them as our starting sample. So these were people who had measures of the things that we were interested in and had dementia uh, links, linkages to their um, uh, health records. And we split them into two groups, a training set of 80% and 20% uh, test sets. And we looked at 30 risk factors that we know from the literature are important in predicting Alzheimer's disease or associated with Alzheimer's disease or dementia in general. And we threw them into a regression and the regression spat out the risk factors out of the 30 that were most predictive. And then we created a score, a risk score using those ones. We then tested that risk score in a test set and compared it to four other existing risk scores that, that currently are used in the literature. And then we also tested our score in an external data set. So this is again, very important to do when you're developing new risk scores is to perform external validations to see how well your score holds up, not only in the sample in which you created, but also in, in a different sample. And essentially what we found was that uh, we our risk score was made up of eight markers that most strongly predicted um, dementia. And those were age, sex, education, and then uh, diabetes, depression, stroke, family history of dementia and the presence of APOE4. 
And what we found was that our score, which is shown down at the bottom here, two versions, one without APOE and one with APOE, um, had a moderate to good uh, discrimination accuracy between or predictive accuracy or to be able to predict dementia in this cohort compared to the other scores here. And it was significant improvements other, over the other scores as well. But the study also highlighted several considerations for the use of dementia risk scores. So these are risk scores that were created in different cohorts. The CADE is quite widely used. Um, and we found that it didn't perform as well as we would have predicted it to perform um, within this cohort. So that sort of raises questions about, um, you know, out of sample performance of these risk scores and actually how well do they predict and how much testing we would need to do on our score as well to be extremely sure that it does um, hold up with similar levels of accuracy across different populations. So again, I would say that this area of risk prediction, it is very promising and exciting, but it definitely needs further work before we can clinically translate these scores into a sort of wide, large scale screenings for whole populations. So with that, I just want to wrap up to talk about sort of the importance of prevention um, uh, in, in not just research, but it has sort of clinical implications and policy implications as well. Um, so recently we had the NHS Health Check expand to include uh, stroke and dementia screenings um, to check, uh, you know, on public level, on population levels, uh, whether you have a risk for developing dementia and then we can intervene at early ages. Um, the Prime Minister's challenge on dementia has been revised and has a big emphasis on prevention. And I had the sort of fantastic opportunity to go into Parliament uh, just before lockdown last March um, to inform their most recent policy, aging policy, which they're calling it the aging brand challenge. Um, and the goal here is to um, improve quality of life by an extra five years um, by 2035. So it's a very ambitious target, but it was a really excellent experience to go in and talk about all of this research and see it sort of inform actual policy that that could impact uh, quality of life in, in aging in this country. So with that, I will end, um, I think well within time. <laughs> and I wanna just thank current and former members of my group, collaborators and funders as well. And thank you to everyone here for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Sana. Uh, let's just stop that. Right. And if you've got questions, please put them in the chat or raise your hand here. Anybody here wants to ask anything? Yeah, go ahead and just shout out, please. Yeah, it's controversial. I mean, one of the controversial things about it as well is the price point. I mean, in the US, they're looking at something like $56,000 for annual users of this drug. I think it has to go in by infusion. Um, so the price is controversial. The efficacy is a little bit debated as well. Um, while it has been shown to clear amyloid across the two trials, uh, the cognitive endpoints in one of the trials was not met. So there's that as well. Um, the need for pushing it through accelerated approval is questionable. Um, why not take its time? But then maybe the decision was that the benefits outweigh that extra time that might be needed. Um, so I think it's, I think it's exciting, but at the same time, a little bit of pause. Right at the back, yeah, go ahead. So thank you so much. And then um, kind of in line with some of the questions that are populated in the chat, how do you go about assigning the value of the data for different weighting factors to some of those risk agents? Um, for example, you mentioned education, computation, um, and then genetic influences as right. well. And so Great. So the question is really about how do you weight these risk factors? How do you weight the risk factors? And uh, while we're there, why don't we talk about the variability in cognitive resilience? Yes. Um, how do you weight the risk factors? So um, there oh, are just, I mean, <laughs> tons of ways that you can do this. Um, the way that we did it here was using the um, lasso logistic regression. So we don't intervene manually in any way. It's a data-driven process. So you submit it into this regression. It picks out the ones that are most predictive, and then the beta weights that are associated with that go from a logistic regression are then used to predict. So it's basically like, um, yeah, if you've got two variables, let's say, and the equation for predicting dementia is AX plus BY, 
um, equals dementia. <laughs> That's in, this is a terrible example, but the A and the B are the weights that you then use to compute your risk score. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's how we weight it. Uh, what was the other question? Right, so that's a bottom-up data-driven way yeah. of, of, weight of doing it exactly. in your sample, but other yeah. people might do it in a different way. Yeah, other people could do it. I mean, there are tons of ways you could do, um, based on the literature, sort of a more manual approach. So you know that, um, so let's say education is important, so you force education into their model, um, you, rather than letting the model pick out education from a list of 100 variables that you may throw in. Um, and so, so in that way, you could sort of force um, models in based on your own approach. Uh, so yeah, there's sort of a data-driven or a manual way to do it. But that weighting doesn't mm -hmm. take into account individual differences. In, it's population in level. Cognitive reserve or resilience. No. So what about that? Exactly. So uh, uh, one of the biggest limitations with this is that we are relying very heavily on population level statistics um, to derive a score that is then going to be used on an individual level. And that can explain why some of these scores perform so poorly out of sample, um, because the, the heterogeneity of one sample in which you create it can be very different from the sample in which you apply it. So for example, a lot of the samples that these scores have been created in are heavily Caucasian. And then you try and apply it in other populations and you see it doesn't translate that well because yeah, the weightings are all off. So I think that captures it in a nutshell. Yeah. Sana, thank you so much. Oh, Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, I should just add as well, if there are any MSC students here, um, the, the follow-up study for the Whitehall is advertised as one of your projects, so if you're interested, yeah, yeah follow up with me. <laughs> okay, um, so we've moved scales, we've gone from IPSCs to population level risk factors, and we're now going back down in scale because it's a pleasure to introduce Sally Cowley, who is the head of the James and Lillian Martin Centre for STEM, STEM Cell Research here. And she's going to tell us a little bit about microglia and neuroinflammation. Thank you, Sally. Great. Thank you very much. So, yes, I get the opportunity to tell you about my favourite cell. Um, so, uh, to overview the session, um, I'll tell you a little bit about the role of microglia um, and their ontogeny and development. I'll introduce uh, neuroinflammation um, in relation to neurodegenerative diseases. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how we investigate microglia and the challenges with that, and how we overcome those challenges more recently with single cell RNA seq approaches and with human IPS cell approaches. And I'll give an example um, in Alzheimer's disease of TREM2. Um, and finally, touch upon the sort of therapeutic aims we have for targeting microglia. So microglia are the resident uh, phagocytic cells of the brain, um, and they are related to macrophages that you find throughout the tissues of the body. Um, they derive um, in embryogenesis from the yolk sac. Uh, let me just get my pointer up here. Um, as primitive macrophages, and they migrate into the developing embryo um, where these primitive macrophages populate all of the different tissues and lead to eventually to things like Kupfer cells in the liver. Um, and also in the brain, um, they become um, fetal microglia. They complete their maturation in the context of the brain um, and become the sort of ramified adult microglia that we're used to looking at. So then um, when they're in the brain, they're receiving a lot of signals from uh, their brain environment. And this will include both cell-cell um, interactions with neurons um, mediated by molecules such as CD200 and CD200 receptor. Um, it will include um, uh, uh, soluble factors such as ICAM and TGF-beta and chemokines. Um, and um, also neurotransmitters. Um, they have receptors for various neurotransmitters and they are even responsive to the electrical activity that's going on uh, in the nearby neurons. Um, and here is an image of them um, in the brain um, in their sort of normal rest, well, they call it resting, but they're not resting at all. Then when they're ramified, um, they're busy um, homeostatically um, surveying their environment. So why are we interested in them? Well, because um, recent, over the past decade, GWAS, um, genome-wide association studies, 
have um, shown that a lot of the genes that are um, associated with neurodegenerative diseases um, are in fact um, expressed in microglia. Um, this is particularly the case for Alzheimer's disease. So um, the classic examples of this are TREM2 and um, downstream components of the TREM2 signaling pathway, including um, uh, PLC gamma2, um, but also some other uh, cell surface molecules such as complement receptor 1, CR1, and CD33. Um, and uh, um, uh, APOE as well itself, um, which is um, expressed by microglia as well as other um, cell types such as astrocytes. Um, and microglia can, um, they can take up the um, misfolded proteins that are involved in these um, diseases. So in um, Alzheimer's, it's amyloid beta and MACTAU, um, and these are um, uh, taken up um, by phagocytosis into the microglia and um, can be de degraded um, and uh, rendered therefore harmless um, um, by fusion of the phagosome with lysosomes. But um, we are working on hypotheses around um, whether they're actually competent um, to always do this and whether they, when they get overloaded with a chronic challenge um, of uh, misfolded proteins such as A-beta, um, then they're not going to be able to cope with that challenge and this can have various sequelae. First of all, um, they will start to spit out inflammatory cytokines. Um, and second of all, they may not be able to fully digest the proteins um, and could potentially spit them out in a partially digested form, um, which could provide seeds for spreading of the, of the disease to nearby neurons. Um, the um, inflammatory cytokines that are produced by these cells um, when they're perturbed include TNF-alpha, IL-1-alpha and beta and C1Q, amongst many others. Um, and under normal inflammatory conditions, um, inflammation will resolve after a few days um, and, uh, and you know, the, the, the initial insult will have been dealt with. But um, in these neurodegenerative diseases, the insult doesn't go away, it's permanently there. And so the microglia are just chronically um, activated and chronically spitting out these cytokines. And that can lead to um, uh, damage of nearby neurons. Um, and the neurons then are more compromised. Um, and uh, this leads to a sort of vicious cycle of um, neurodegeneration and, and activation of the microglia. Um, so then, as well as Alzheimer's disease, um, motor neurone disease, or ALS, um, one of the key genes associated with, with that is C9-ORF72, which is a RAB um, uh, GEF or uh, guanine exchange factor. Um, and that is um, expressed in microglia and macrophages um, and has been shown in mouse models that uh, um, if you have a um, knockout mouse model, then it leads to um, uh, a sort of chronic inflammatory state um, including microglial activation. Um, then we have in Parkinson's disease. Well, there's alpha synuclein is the misfolded protein that's associated with Parkinson's disease. And so that too can be taken up and dealt with or not um, by microglia. Um, and some of the um, intracellular genes that are associated with Parkinson's are always are also expressed in, in microglia. So um, GBA, which is a lysosomal, um, protein. I mean, it's just it's in many cells, but lysosomal function is incredibly important in macrophage and microglial lineages. Um, and LARC2 is associated with um, immune cells in particular, um, including microglia potentially. So um, there's good evidence for the role of microglia um, from these GWAS studies. Um, so um, let's think a bit more about uh, what happens when they're, they're activated. So when they're in their normal homeostatic resting stage, um, they, are, uh, they are highly ramified and they're busy um, surveying their environment. And I'll show you some videos of that in a minute. Uh, but when they become activated and angry, <laughs> they, uh, with, they withdraw their ramifications and they become what is called amoeboid. Um, this is an example from traumatic brain injury, so it's quite severe, but um, it's, it's observable in Alzheimer's disease as well. 
um, and these amoeboid microglia, um, they will surround the amyloid beta plaques um, and um, sort of almost seal them off. Um, and there's a lot of debate in the field as to what, um, what's going on here and whether this is a, a net uh, benefit um, and is actually slowing the progression of uh, the spread of the um, A beta um, or whether it's actually um, causing the microglia to be angry and, and contribute to the progression of the disease. Um, but the, the uh, microglia that are associated with these plaques um, have uh, been given the name uh, DAM microglia. DAM, they express a, a subset of um, genes, uh, disease-associated microglia, um, which are associated with this, uh, um, this state. And it includes um, uh, upregulation of TREM2. Um, but as I say, whether these DAM microglia are of uh, net benefit or, or not is still open to debate. So how do we investigate uh, the role of microglia in these um, diseases? Well, um, as Noel was sort of giving in his historical sort of review um, earlier, um, the field started off looking at um, just transformed cell lines, um, such as uh, murine BV2 microglia, which uh, uh, these cell lines are from, um, from tumors. So they're not really a very appropriate model and they're usually karyotypically very abnormal. So THP1, for example, here is the karyogram of THP1. You can immediately see that um, there's trisomies of several of the chromosomes. Um, and so this is going to give an incorrect gene dosage. And this is really problematic for um, the diseases that we're studying because, um, for example, in Parkinson's disease, just a doubling of the amount of alpha synuclein um, uh, in patients who have a triplication of the alpha synuclein locus can lead to early onset Parkinson's, familial Parkinson's. Um, and so it's clearly not a good idea to be trying to model um, those kinds of uh, diseases um, with cells that are karyotypically abnormal in the first place. Secondly, they don't terminally differentiate. So microglia under normal circumstances don't proliferate very much. Um, they, are, uh, they can proliferate when they are activated, but they're not normally proliferating. Um, and um, these cancer cell lines, of course, they are continuously um, proliferating and they're hard to get them to terminally differentiate. Um, and also um, their metabolism is very different. Um, being cancer cell lines, they're highly reliant on glycolysis. Uh, the mouse has been a fantastic model for understanding microglial biology in situ in the brain. Um, but we find that uh, microglia tend to lose their identity when they're taken out of the brain and cultured in a dish. Um, but most importantly, um, not all of the pathways that we're interested in studying are um, conserved or appropriately regulated in murine models. Um, and for example, um, 15 of the 44 um, eight out main Alzheimer's genes um, um, have no ortholog in the mouse. Um, and um, this is quite problematic. Um, for example, the APOE polymorphism is absent in the mouse. Um, complement receptor one isoforms um, cannot be replicated in the mouse. Um, and really importantly, the TREM2, um, the main mutation that is associated with Alzheimer's disease um, in TREM2 is the R47H mutation. Um, and it um, in the mouse, it leads to um, aberrant splicing. Um, which leads to um, nonsense mediated decay of the protein. And so it's effectively a null mutation. So that people were working on this mouse model of the R47H mutation um, for several years, not realizing that actually they were effectively working on a knockout. Um, and um, it's, this splicing uh, issue does not happen in the, in the human form. It leads to a perfectly full length um, protein. So then we have uh, human primary microglia. Well, they're very hard to source, obviously, because they're in the brain. Um, you can um, obtain fetal microglia if you have access to
to, um, to abortuses. Um, and adult microglia um, can be obtained through um, neurosurgery tech procedures, um, but they're pretty rare. Um, but when there, there's a study that I'll talk about in a little while, where uh, single cell RNA-seq um, from adult brain neurosurgery patients um, is now helping to reveal the different subsets of microglia that are present in the brain. Um, then we have um, human primary macrophages. Well, you know, it is possible to just get macrophages from blood um, by taking blood monocytes and differentiating them with MCSF in a dish. Um, but these actually have a different ontogeny to microglia because they are from adult hematopoiesis um, that is undertaken in the bone marrow. They're not from that primitive um, hematopoiesis that happens in the very early waves of embryogenesis. So they have a different ontogeny and they, are, um, they have different responses as a result of it. Um, also, if you're taking blood packs, they're different genetically and phenotypically every time that you take a, get a blood pack. So you can't do, you know, good repeats of experiments. Um, they can be quite hard to um, genetically modify. And obviously, you've, you know, you've only got that one, uh, you can't clone them, so you don't have an indefinite resource. So there's many problems with um, um, modeling microglia, um, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the RNA-seq approach um, from actual human brain material and a little bit about iPS cells. So um, in the last three or so years, there's been fantastic um, studies coming out of single cell RNA-seq um, from um, human brain material. Now, when it's taken from um, um, uh, donated brains are a post-mortem, then obviously the time that is taken to get the brain um, to be able to actually extract the microglia um, is going to make a huge difference to um, how uh, the microglia are phenotypically because they are extremely responsive to changes in the brain um, and in the dead brain, they're going to start to become reactive. So that's been a major limitation in those kind of post-mortem studies. Um, in surgical studies, you have slightly uh, better time windows um, because it's possible to be there in the theater and, and actually take a sample and, and get it um, processed really quickly. Um, so um, this is the most recent study that's been um, published to my knowledge. Um, and um, it's we used um, neurosurgery patient material, um, so really rapid processing of the samples, um, and from an impressively large number of neurosurgery patients, given the difficulty in obtaining these samples. Um, and so um, taking the, the um, sort of bits of um, the, the brain that is, you know, that is surplus to the, in, in these neurosurgery samples, and they're very small, um, they can isolate the IL, um, CD11B sam, uh, cells, which are the microglia, um, by fact sorting, um, and do single cell RNA-seq from them. Um, and then um, uh, these are the kind of um, maps that you end up with of um, uh, all of the single cells that come out of this kind of analysis. Um, and so they can be grouped according to um, their different phenotypes. Um, and so what um, is found is that different um, types of uh, neurosurgery patients um, have different microglial profiles. Um, and so um, the, the controls um, will have fairly homeostatic uh, microglia, um, but uh, ones who've undergone a trauma or hemorrhage um, have quite a lot of these um, activated microglia um, that have upregulated um, MHC um, proteins for an uh, antigen presentation um, and the immune response genes. Um, so that is something to sort of um, look out for in the literature as these, um, there'll be more and more studies like this coming out, I'm sure. Um, but my speciality is to use iPS cells to model neuroinflammation, um, and it gives the advantages that um, we can work with, you know, authentic differentiated cell types in either monoculture or co-culture. 
um, that we have the correct gene variants, you know, um, with the correct APOE polymorphisms and correct um, human splicing um, and all the rest of it that I've already discussed. Um, and, um, you know, we can also work with disease mutations that can't be readily engineered into a mouse or into a, into a cancer cell model. Um, so um, things like the C9 orf um, 72 expansion repeats that you see in motor neurone disease, these are thousands of hexanucleotide repeats and you can't really engineer that into a cell line, but we have them there yes, from the patient iPS cells. Um, and um, we can also um, model polygenic diseases, um, which includes, of course, Alzheimer's, because it's not just APOE, which is the only um, risk factor um, genetically, but there are many contributing um, uh, genetic um, risks. Um, and uh, we're compiling polygenic risk scores now that can um, help us to understand that better. Um, so to make um, iPS-derived microglia, um, we um, devised a, a methodology for um, differentiating them um, along the myeloid, primitive myeloid route um, from iPS cells um, to uh, sort of primitive macrophage. Um, and we know that this is going through a primitive hematopoietic program rather than an adult um, definitive hematopoietic program, because if we knock out um, CMIB, which is required for adult hematopoiesis, um, it doesn't affect the differentiation process at all. So they must be going through a, a primitive program. Um, and so this makes them um, appropriate as a starting point for modeling microglia. So we can skew these macrophages to becoming more microglial-like by um, co-culturing them with iPS-derived neurons. We're not the only people to have done this. Um, when our paper came out, there were about half a dozen others as well around the world doing similar things. Um, and um, these protocols have become more and more um, uh, complex um, from just uh, mono, monocultures through to uh, um, dual co-cultures in 2D through to 3D um, co-cultures um, through to organi organoids. Um, and in the last um, couple of years, um, there's been a move to transplant these um, iPS microglia into um, rodent brains. Um, and they engraft really nicely and they ramify beautifully and they look uh, for all the world like, um, you know, primary microglia in a brain. Um, this is to show the general um, phagocytic competence of these cells. This is just generic, the generic iPS mic macrophages rather than skewed to microglia. But if you look at this here, it's, um, it's about to eat this um, alpha synuclein particle that was uh, fluorescing. Um, and um, uh, they migrate towards these particles and then, um, and then actively eat them. Um, and if we let the um, video loop again after it's done that, then you'll be able to see up here in this other corner, um, this cell here um, has obviously eaten too much and then it, uh, it, it dies um, and it's immediately consumed by its neighbors. And this is part of the normal homeostatic function of these um, macrophage populations throughout the body to clear up all of the debris. Um, so here we have um, iPS microglia in red um, on a bed of iPS cortical neurons. Um, and you can see that they are roughly tiling across the field of view. And that's, uh, that's what they do in the brain as well. They seem to um, occupy territories. Um, and within those territories, they will um, survey the neuronal populations um, very actively, um, checking out what needs to be uh, trimmed in terms of neuronal synapses or dying neurons or whatever. Um, and this is a very active process. So this um, video is one frame every 12 seconds. So you can see that every frame, there is a change in the ramifications of the microglia as they're surveying that this is on a bed of neurons still, but we're just looking at the, um, at the microglial channel. Um, so there, this is a really, really very active process, which is why I don't like the word, the phrase resting microglia, because they're just not. <laughs> And um, here they are on a, uh, now in green on a bed of uh, red neurons. Um, and I'm 
going to show you, if you look at the green arrow, um, when I start the video, you'll be able to see that the microglia in the centre is very interested in the what's going on in that neuronal um, cluster, and it keeps revisiting it um, and then decides eventually to phagocytose something. So there it is. Uh, thinks, sorry, I'm anthropomorphizing too much. Um, it revisits that um, area in that neuronal cluster two, three times. And then when it decides to um, now, it forms a donut shape and it pulls that whatever it's phagocytose, that bit of dying neuron back into the cell body. So we can observe those kinds of uh, events in these co-cultures um, and quantify them. Um, and um, as well as co-cultures, we can make the uh, cultures more complex by adding in astrocytes. Um, and um, the reason for doing that is because there's an emerging field um, of evidence showing that there is quite a lot of crosstalk between these three cell types. So um, we know that um, uh, neurons that are um, damage will um, secrete a, um, a beta and tau um, and uh, damage associated um, molecular patterns, damps, um, and that will be detected by microglia and will activate them and lead to um, secretion of um, cytokines that can be damaging and potentially the phagocytosis of either the whole neuron or the um, part of the neuron that's damaged. Um, astrocytes, of course, are um, uh, very good at um, um, uh, homeostatic um, uh, maintenance of, of the neurons by things like glutamate uptake from the neurons, and they will also secrete um, cytokines that um, help to keep microglia in a, um, a homeostatically sort of balanced state, such as IL-33. Um, and um, we know that microglia can produce these cytokines that are a sort of toxic cocktail of cytokines that can make astrocytes um, become activated as well. And they, um, so we talk about M1 and M2 macrophages and M1 and M2 microglia as different sort of activation states. Well, people also talk now about A1 and A2 astrocytes. So A1 astrocytes are um, activated astrocytes and uh, they become activated by that cocktail of cytokines and they can produce uh, toxic factors that are capable of killing the neurons. So this sort of um, three-way crosstalk is, um, is really important and we can model that in the dish. Um, and then finally, I will um, talk to you a little bit about TREM2. So you've seen a sort of more elaborate version of this um, from Noel's talk. Um, in um, this uh, um, shows where TREM2 lies in terms of the population frequency and it's uh, the, the relative risk of the R47H mutation um, in, um, in um, the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and you'll also notice um, from the color coding that um, several other of these um, uh, genes are also involved in immune responses as I described at the beginning of the talk. So TREM2 has um, been the focus of a lot of interest um, amongst um, immunologists who are interested in Alzheimer's. Um, so it's a phagocytosis receptor um, and it's a single membrane pass receptor um, with an Ig-like domain. Um, and the R47H mutation lies within that extracellular domain. Um, and um, the, um, uh, this extracellular domain is um, capable of binding A beta oligomers and APOE and also phosphatidyl serine, which is phosphatidyl serine is expressed on the, um, on the surface of dying cells. Um, so it's, um, it's got several different um, potential ligands. It's quite promiscuous in that regard. Um, it has a signaling pathway that includes um, SICK and uh, PLC gamma 2, um, and that um, leads to um, survival and proliferation and phagocytosis. Um, and uh, can also impact on other signaling pathways such as the um, MAP kinase pathway. Um, so the, the R47H mutation has been 
um, suggested to be implicated in ligand binding, glycosylation, trafficking, phagocytosis, survival, inflammation, chemotaxis, all of these things. Um, but um, remember that I told you that the uh, mouse model um, for TREM2 R47H um, was actually a null mutation. And so that sort of diverted the field down a cul-de-sac for a little bit. Um, now people have developed a um, humanized TREM2 um, mouse model on a um, AD background. Um, and what did they find in that? Well, they found that um, the, the R47H um, did not actually reduce the clustering of microglia around mammaloid plaques, although the knockout did. So R47H, uh, the human version of R47H, is not, is not phenocopying the knockout exactly. And in IPS microglia, um, similarly, um, R47H did not reduce the clearance of plaques, although the knockout did. So there's something more subtle going on with the R47H mutation. Um, so we had a look at it in our IPS microglia and um, using a um, isogenic series of um, cells, IPS cells, um, which were either wild type or knocked out for TREM2 or had the R47H mutation in um, so against uh, by an isogenic series, we mean it's all on the same genetic background. So the only difference between the cells is what we have uh, um, gen gene edited in terms of uh, TREM2. Um, so it's a very nice kind, kind of uh, experimental setup. Um, and um, we ran through a battery of um, typical kinds of assays that you would run for these cells. And the TREM2 knockout does what you expect. It has reduced phagocytosis um, and it uh, does not survive so well when it's uh, had growth factor withdrawal and it doesn't move around so well by um, uh, C5A mediated chemotaxis. But the R47H um, mutation didn't have those same phenotypic effects. Um, and um, we've, we're finding that the phenotypes are really incredibly subtle. Um, it is shed more readily um, from the cell surface than the wild type. Though we don't really understand why, because the mutation is not in the sort of um, uh, part of the transmembrane domain where the um, cleavage might happen. Um, so it's not displaying those gross um, phenotypic de uh, defects. So we turn to um, uh, transcriptomics to um, have a more sort of um, unbiased um, and thorough look. Um, and I'm not going to show you the transcriptomics through lack of time, um, but the basic take home message is that the um, transcriptomic changes in the R47H mutated cells do follow that they're in the same direction as the knockout is. Um, but they're just not so many differentially expressed genes. So it's a much more subtle uh, phenotypic uh, transcriptomic change um, for the R47H. So it is a sort of partial, it's behaving like a partial knockout. Um, and um, uh, we were able from the transcriptomic results to be able to um, follow up some hits and show that indeed there were some um, phenotypic uh, similarities between the knockout and the R47H in terms of adhesion proteins. So the cell um, cannot bind to their subcellular substrate quite as well, and this is going to affect how they're able to move around in the brain. Um, there are other people working on this problem as well, um, and so Jennifer Pocock's group in London, UCL, have shown that the R47H uh, mutation um, has a sort of locked metabolic switch. So it's not able to, um, when the cells are activated, they microglia would normally switch from um, uh, oxidative um, phosphorylation and switch on glycolysis to be able to handle their um, increased metabolic demand. Um, and the R47H mutated cells are not able to do that. So they're not able to respond appropriately to the immune challenges that they're faced with in the brain. Um, so all of this supports this kind of hypothesized partial loss of function of the R47H TREM2. Um, it's not as severe as a TREM2 knockout. 
Um, but this is very typical of the mutations that we're wanting to study um, that are associated with Alzheimer's or other um, neurodegenerative diseases, because these are all diseases that take decades to manifest themselves. And so inevitably, the things that we're looking at in a, on a cellular level are going to be pretty subtle. Um, and so we have to work quite hard to find them, but they are there. Um, we just need to know how to look for them, how to find them. So to summarize, um, I've talked a little bit about how microglia are involved in uh, neuroinflammation. Um, I've talked about how um, disease mi associated microglia genes are, um, can be um, associated with phagocytosis um, and also the downstream uh, signaling um, components um, in microglia. Um, I've given you the example of TREM2 and phospholipid. C gamma 2. So what about therapeutic aims? What do we want to try and achieve in terms of targeting um, microglia as far as therapies is concerned? So, well, it's a really tricky one because um, uh, we don't want to completely ablate um, microglial function. Um, because they are doing, you know, under normal circumstances, they're doing a really important homeostatic job. Um, but what we want to do is dampen inflammatory responses. And we probably want to um, just try and make them more focused, more targeted in what they phagocytose. So we don't want to just generally increase their phagocytic ability, for example, because they might start phagocytosing things that they shouldn't you know, that are perfectly fine. The cells that might just have flipped a little bit of phosphatidyl serine, but actually then they're going to get you know, sort themselves out and be okay again. Um, so um, we want them to be able to clear the protein aggregates and any dead cells, but not any still functional cells. Um, and so that is why I think that um, the, um, the current clinical trials that are going on for um, um, monoclonal antibodies targeting amyloid beta and in Parkinson's targeting alpha-synuclein and uh, back to Alzheimer's ones targeting tau um, coming online as well. I think that those are really interesting um, and um, because they're basically giving the microglia a helping hand. Microglia have um, FC receptors um, you know, they want to be able to clear stuff out. And if there's an antibody there that will give them a helping hand um, to be able to do that, then um, that's, that's great in a very sort of targeted way. Um, and so I'm watching with great interest in all of these clinical trials going on. Um, and I agree with the previous speaker that um, there's some controversy still around things like the aducanumab um, uh, trials, but um, it's still early days. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zelly. It's an absolutely fascinating overview. Thank you very much. Um, let me just kick off by asking you something. So are all microglia the same? Or can we have differentiation within these microglia? Right. Well, so it's obviously not the same as, I mean, neuroscientists, you know, are used to categorizing neurons into different uh, subtypes um, and thinking of them in a, as being rather sort of fixed in that subtype. Mm. Um, whereas with microglia, it's really not like that at all. Um, and they can change their phenotype and um, they can, you know, they're incredibly um, um, plastic cells. Um, and so, you know, they can become activated, but then they can revert back to a non-activated state. Um, you know, where they find themselves will inform uh, what their phenotype is as well. So it's really But very, if I very took cool. microglia A and B and did the same manipulations, would I get the same kind of responses or are there very different types of responses mm. to the context? Mm. Um, so um, there are um, in different parts of the brain, there are different, uh, you know, my, we're just beginning to scratch the surface really of how different um, my, microglia are in different parts of the brain. We know already that they are, uh, there are different densities of microglia in, in different parts of the brain, um, but how that impacts on their um, actual phenotype is really, you know, these kind of single cell analyses are going to kind of uh, get to the bottom of that.
pretty soon, I think. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Yeah. Um, we're making musical cultures of the current of brain cell facts. How do you decide the relation between neurons, as we said, and like the edit? Are there some kind of threshold over which you should go and pass on? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so, well, we know in the brain what the approximate ratios of microglia to neurons are, and it's usually, you know, around 5% microglia. Um, and so that's what we're kind of aiming for, for microglia. So we're kind of um, trying to be informed as much as possible by the brain environment that we're trying to mimic. For astrocytes, yeah, we haven't really optimized that yet. <laughs> Um, but uh, um, the, um, it's kind of it's also complicated by the fact that they, the cells have different um, proliferation rates. Um, so um, we often have to um, uh, inactivate the cells, like the astrocytes, far too proliferative. So they have to be inactivated to stop them, so that we can get them at the right ratios. I've got one here from Zoltan. Are there gender specific differences in microglial function? I, um, yes, I think there are, but I've never, I can't really say much more than that, I'm afraid. Right. Okay. And one more, yeah, shout out, please. Is it different in neurons? Microglia can proliferate through microglia, whereas neurons can proliferate through cells. Is there any research into whether like newborn microglia will act differently? Do you mind just oh, right. So, well? um, the question is about um, what the differences are between newborn um, microglia and, and um, adult microglia, um, and uh, how that would um, how we would deal with that in a sort of Alzheimer's context. Um, and again, we really are just scratching the surface about what we what do we understand about aging in microglia. Um, and the problem with this is that um, uh, what is the, the senescence field um, uh, has certain, you know, certain senescence markers, favorite uh, molecules for, you know, as, as markers of senescence. But the problem is that those same senescence molecules are often things that microglia and macrophages produce anyway, like IL-6, for example. So, I think we've still got a long way to go to really understand what an aging microglia is. That's a good question. Great. Thank you so much, Sunny. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Right, we're going to stretch our technical expertise here to one more limit. Have we got Gwen? Ah, Gwen. Gwen, sir. Yeah. Can you hear us okay? Yeah. Yes, I can, but uh, if there are any questions in the audience, I will need you to relay it because I can't. I yes, can't. of course. And can you just speak up for us, Gwen, just so that we've got a mic, a check here on the sound? Yes, yeah, sure. Just say it again. Can you, can you hear me properly? Yeah, we can, I think. Is that all right at the back? You can hear? Yeah, okay. Very good. Yeah, this is pretty pretty good. It's a three-way three interaction we've had today. Um, so let me introduce Gwen, who uh, many of you know, she's uh, actually started off as a physicist, didn't you, Gwen? Uh, uh, math, actually. Maths, physics, and then neuroscience. And she's going to take us to the final talk today because she's done a, a lot of work um, at the Wellcome Trust uh, Centre for Integrative Neuroimaging, WIN. And she's going to give us uh, an overview of neuroimaging in dementia and where we've come with that. So go ahead, Gwen. And if there are any problems, I'll come back. Yes, please, please do. Can you see properly my slides? We can. Excellent. So thank you very much for uh, the invitation. And I'm sorry I couldn't be uh, with you all today in person and see your faces and everything, because I, I really like to be able to interact with people and see the frowns and everything. But anyway, what I've been tasked by Master today is uh, with presenting some, uh, some slides on your imaging in dementia. And obviously, that's a very wide brief. So what I've decided to do is to look at some of our uh, own studies and hopefully show you what it can tell us, uh, what brain imaging and, and brain MRI can tell us really in small and big data sets. So a bit of context, I'm from the FEMREP Center, um, which is part itself of the bigger uh, Wacom uh, Trust Center for Integrative Neuroimaging. 
And the Femme Center was founded more than 20 years ago now. Um, you can see it on, on the right. And it boasts two scanners, the seven, a seven Tesla scanner and a 3T scanner. And it's got also three different themes. Uh, the physics theme, which deals with the Im image acquisition side of things, uh, but also basic and clinical neuroscience theme uh, and an analysis theme. And that analysis theme is really dealing with image processing and statistics. And for those of you who are aware, uh, we also developed the FSL software She's one of uh, the most uh, used brain imaging uh, software in uh, the world. Um, and basically, my group has got this unique position of sitting between these last two themes, probably because of the background that, that I have to start with. So uh, obviously, today I'm going to talk to you about dementia. And Sana has done a, a very good job already of introducing things uh, for me. But uh, you need to bear in mind that uh, these studies could have been done on any kind of neurodegenerative disorders, Parkinson's, Huntington's, because they really uh, share some commonalities, common traits. Obviously, they are due to progressive damage and death of primarily neurons. And obviously, do not forget about the astrocytes, do not forget about uh, the glia, as we've just seen. But they also share some uh, genetics. Uh, so for instance, um, ALS or motor neuron disease, for those of you who are American, NFTD, uh, protein, proteinopathy with tau, for instance, uh, shared between PD and Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease, et cetera, et cetera. But more importantly, as Sana has already mentioned, one key point here, and it's really, really important to understand that, is that the brain is amazing. It is resilient. And it is so resilient that actually when the symptoms become apparent, when we can, with confidence, diagnose with confidence, again, with some uncertainty, when we can diagnose these disorders, already 60 to 7% of the degeneration has occurred in the structures that are you know, primary uh, at play in these disorders. So Parkinson's disease, that will be uh, very roughly the substantia nigra, and Huntington's disease, the striatum, and Alzheimer's disease, the medial temporal lobe. So it is already probably too late, and that's why a lot of effort has been done in trying to look very early on whether we can uh, detect some differences in uh, early, at early uh, uh, stages of the disorders before even it gets formally uh, diagnosed. So what can we gain from using MRI? I hope I will be able to answer four questions today. Uh, first of all, can we detect and predict the progression to dementia at an early stage? I've just explained why it is so important and Sana really did a great job at that as well. But if we can detect very early on people who will go on to uh, progress to dementia, can the time be used to slow down the progression to dementia? On a more basic level, uh, basic as in you know, neuroscientific question, can we understand the spread of the disease in the brain? And if so, can we identify and quantify the impact of deleterious risk factors on these network basically of different brain regions that can explain the spread of the disease. And so for the very first question, this was a, a study uh, published about eight years ago now, uh, where we looked at predicting uh, the progression to Alzheimer's disease and detecting it. So there are always figures that are uh, bonded around uh, and that are all absolutely harrowing in terms of Alzheimer's disease. Sana used uh, the uh, Alzheimer's disease being diagnosed every three seconds. Uh, this time uh, here, you've got another one that I pick, which is one in 20 people who will be suffering from dementia in nine years. So that's 5% of the population. And as a very, very rough uh, uh, mm, approximation, you can consider that mild cognitive impairment, so MCI, is an intermediate between healthy aging and Alzheimer's disease. Problem with MCI is that it's clinically very heterogeneous you will have 50% of people with mild cognitive impairment that will progress to Alzheimer's disease after five years. But some will stay MCI all of their lives, uh, it's called stable MCI. Some will actually even revert to cognitively healthy aging. So what we did in this study uh, was to look at MCI participants who were scanned at baseline and then very carefully followed up clinically and neuropsychologically every year for up to, I think, six to seven years. 
And these were participants, some went on to progress to Alzheimer's disease, but what we were interested in here were people who had progressed to Alzheimer's disease at least two years after the scan. So that it gives us, if you want, a window of opportunity to do something. If we can detect very early on that they will progress in the future in at least two years, to Alzheimer's disease, it might give us just enough time to do something about it. The control group in that case was stable MCI. And in that case, we looked at stable MCI that stayed stable for at least three years. So really quite a different group again uh, that stayed uh, stable, did not progress to Alzheimer's disease for at least three years. Then what we did was to contrast these two at baseline again, uh, you looking at gray matter and white matter differences. And so we started off with a pretty healthy uh, MCI group. Um, we had also healthy controls in Alzheimer's disease, but I won't go into the details of this. And then shrunk it, which seems mad, but for this study made a lot of sense. So we removed all the MCI participants that had progressed to Alzheimer's disease too fast after their baseline scan, because we really wanted that solid window of two years without progressing to uh, Alzheimer's disease. So we looked at these 13 progressive MCI who progressed to Alzheimer's disease at least two years later, and that's actually two year and a half on average. And we had 22 stable MCI who stayed stable for at least three years, actually it was uh, on average four years. That was something we published in Journal of Neuroscience. One thing that is really important here, and that's crucial if you want to press upon the benefit of using brain MRI is that for all intended purposes and to the clinicians, there was no difference at baseline between the two groups. These two groups of MCI participants for all the clinical measures just look the same. That is crucial because otherwise there's no benefit in putting them in a scanner if, if actually a good clinician just looking at two different, you know, two, these two MCI participants, one from each group would be able to tell you you know, have a strong inkling of which one would progress to Alzheimer's disease. So for all intent and purposes, these were completely the same on clinical and neuropsychological measures. But actually when we looked into the brain, we could see a consistent damage of already at baseline, so more than two years before they progressed to Alzheimer's disease in the medial temporal lobe, but not only, and essentially more marked on in the left hippocampus. So you can see here in, uh, in white is actually a probabilistic map of the gray matter distribution in the brain. And in blue is showing the differences, the significant differences at baseline between these two groups of MCR participants that are just the same clinically and neuropsychologically. You can see here also using a diffusion tensor uh, uh, index of mean diffusivity, which is, as Sana said, a, a kind of proxy for microstructural damage. We see again marked uh, differences in the hippocampus, but essentially, again, more on the left side. And in the white matter going into the uh, fimbria of the phonics. So again, the white matter tracks that connect the hippocampus. And I'll skip over this for just um, a matter of uh, keeping in the time. One thing here, really, that I would like to illustrate with this slide is the benefit of combining different modality, different type of information in terms of imaging. So you've got the information of the volume of the hippocampus on the x-axis, obviously the higher the better. And then on the y-axis, the uh, increasing microstructural damage, the lower the better, that we obtain with diffusion images. So obviously, if you look at an MCI participant, and they seem to be faring quite well separately, if you look separately just at the x-axis or the y-axis, then you will say, well, this MCI participant should be doing pretty well. That's when you look at the pattern in 2D of the stable in yellow and a progressive MCI in red, that you can actually probably have a different conclusion. And if you do that properly, which is we require some out of sample, what we can do is actually uh, predict, uh, accurately predict who will progress to Alzheimer's disease with 90%, 91% accuracy, combining the different uh, imaging modalities, but also CSF markers. That is something that is done in MCI participants. And obviously, these are the participants you will be able to get to see 
realistically, they start having memory complaint, they will go to their GP, they will be sent to a memory clinic, they will be sent for a scan, different type of scan as we've seen. It can also be seen by following for long enough healthy controls, but that's obviously not something that can be done in clinical routine. Uh, and something that has been shown by Giovanna uh, Zamboni uh, uh, when she was in Oxford, showing that if you look at healthy controls and you follow them for long enough, you can see again, uh, looking at the volume of the hippocampus at marked differences seven to 10 years before they progress to Alzheimer's disease. So uh, to answer the first question, can we detect and predict the progression to dementia at an early stage? Absolutely, we can. More than two years and a half before progression with 91% accuracy. So what can be done with that, right? We've got now two years, but as Sana has said, and as I will say again, there is no disease modifying treatment to date. Uh, okay, won't go into the details. Probably everybody put uh, all their eggs in the same uh, beta amyloid basket. And what kind of population they were looking at? Probably again, Alzheimer's disease, it's in sometimes severe cases of Alzheimer's disease, and that's already too late to be able to reverse the damage. As I've shown, 60 to 70% of the grammar is already lost. So, Alternative approaches, Sana uh, touched upon this uh, very uh, nicely before. Well, the one thing is to modify non-genetic non risk factors. There's been these uh, Lancet Commission papers in 2017, updated in 2020, looking at nine and then 12 different uh, modifiable risk factors and shown, showing that if you were to uh, act upon these uh, modifiable risk factors, you could probably prevent or delay Alzheimer's, but you know, if you delay it enough, then you will die of old age before getting Alzheimer's disease. So prevent and delay Alzheimer's disease by 40%. So the whole idea here is to treat people who are at risk for dementia, mildly cognitively impaired participants before they develop the major symptoms. One such modifiable treatment, uh, one such one such uh, modifiable risk factor is high levels of homocysteine in the blood. These are consistently associated with dementia and cognitive decline, and they can be lowered uh, with bit, bit, vitamin Bs. Fortunately, like a awful lot of uh, randomized controlled trials in, in dementia, the impact of B vitamin treatment has been really inconsistent so far. Uh, it can be due to a lot of different things, different B vitamins used, different dosage of them, different population, again, Alzheimer's disease, probably far too late. Different durations, I think there were some that were over only a few weeks um, over and some over a few years, and all of them focused on cognitive function. And here I will say something that Masood might not like necessarily, but it could be the case that if you use a measure that is less subject to short-term fluctuations, such as whether you've slept properly the night before, whether you had your coffee in the morning, whether you've got quite a lot on your mind, you know, that can influence neuropsychological uh, tests or clinical tests. So a measure that is less subject to these you know, small fluctuations might prove more robust to capture the impact of the treatment. And obviously I'm preaching for my own choir here, but I'm trying to you know, try to sell you uh, the use of brain MRI, in particular for randomized control trial. So here, uh, that trial um, was a vitamin B treatment trial uh, carried out for two years in 156 uh, MCR participants who were over 70 years old. Uh, they were perfectly matched, ran randomized, perfectly matched for what we get about age, uh, sex, age by sex, homocysteine levels in the blood at baseline, vitamin B levels at baseline, et cetera. And what we looked at uh, was the gram matter volume loss assessed uh, voxel-wise. So that was using a, a method that I developed in FSL uh, based on concepts that had been um, proposed uh, earlier on by uh, UCL. And that was published in uh, PNAS. So what did we see? Well, we've got the placebo group. There are MCI participants, they are over 70. So there is a clear gram matter loss over two years, again here, in white, you see the probabilistic map uh, distribution of grammata, and in yellow is where the placebo group has lost grammata over two years. You can see it's really widespread, very strongly uh, uh, across the medial temporal lobe. But in a B vitamin group, it seems like over these two years, the, the reduction, the, the atrophy is, is far less pronounced. Obviously, that 
doesn't count for anything statistically, because what you need to do is an interaction. You need an interaction between the time and the, and the groups, between the placebo and BP means you're asking, is there a difference in the slope of a time? And indeed there is. If you do a formal comparison, you see that in all of these blue regions, we see a benefit of the B vitamin treatment in MCI. With a reduction of atrophy in the regions that really matter, the bilateral hippocampus, the parahippocampus, the retrospinal quickness, et, et cetera. And in these blue regions, what we see is that the vitamin B group has uh, lost almost on average, no gram matter over these two years, but the placebo group has lost almost 4% of that gram matter. And it's even more uh, pronounced than that, because one clear thing is the treatment is only effective in patients with high level of homocysteine. If you separate, looking at their median values, placebo and treatment group into whether at baseline they had low or high level of homocysteine. Remember, we're trying to lower the effect of high level of homocysteine with B vitamins. Well, if it's slow to start with, the treatment is not beneficial. You, you don't have anything to act upon. But if it is high to start with, then you see again a massive difference. And in these green regions, what you see is that the vitamin B group on average has lost a bit less than 1%, while the placebo group has lost more than 5% over the two years. And another thing that Bernie Machin can do uh, to you, and something that I'm sure Michelle showed you this morning, just to give you a link into this kind of modeling that we can do. So here it was a Bayesian network causal modeling where we put all of the, our uh, variables, the treatment, the different vitamin B uh, levels, the changes in the vitamin B levels, changes in gram matter, changes in cognition. And if you reorient this, what you'll see is that the treatment is lowering the uh, levels of homocysteine in the blood via essentially vitamin B12. And that lowering of homocysteine in turn reduces markedly the atrophy over the two years in the grammata. And that in turn finally correlates with the changes in the sum of boxes, that's the sub here, which is the, clinic, the clinical dementia rating. That really tells you, brain MRI here gives you a missing link between the treatment and the cognitive changes. But what it gives you as well is the power to detect these differences with a lower sample size. Because here we could see them in 156 uh, partic MCI participants, but to see the differences with the cl clinical dementia rating, we needed a larger group to be able to see that. And as, as I said, Michelle, I'm sure you presented this morning, sorry, I couldn't attend. Um, again, to show that what brain imaging can give you is some very good intermediary to try to interpret some kind of modeling between age or cardiovascular risk factors and cognition. So uh, second question, what can be gained from using MRI? Well, here, the time gain can be uh, by being able to predict maybe early on or detect very early on which one are going to progress to Alzheimer's disease can be used to slow down the progression to dementia using, in that case, B12 in people at risk uh, for dementia. Why? Because they have high level of homocysteine. So that's one of the pathways Sana showed you You've got many different pathways to get to Alzheimer's disease. One is high level of homocysteine. And for these, if you use vitamin B12 in the people at risk, you've got a reduction by ninefold of the atrophy over two years. So for something a bit different and looking at more um, a basic neuroscientific question, can we understand the spread of the disease from looking at a healthy brain? And that's something that is that was quite a small revolution when uh, Bill Seeley and uh, Mike Gracious in uh, Stanford presented this in 2009, showing that basically you can understand the disease spread. It was cortical basal dementia, uh, dementia it was in PSP, it was in FT, frontotemporal dementia, sorry for the, all the acronyms. Um, basically, uh, from looking at the healthy brain, how it is connected structurally, how it is connected functionally, how it develops together, how maybe different brain regions work together and develop together, we can understand the spread of neurodegenerative disorders looking simply at the healthy brain. That's something that we did ourselves uh, that was published in PNS in 2014. Now, I won't bore you with the details, and then I don't have that much time either anyway, 
But this time we had 500, about 500 healthy subjects, I insist on healthy, covering most of the lifespan, 8 to 85. And what the only information we had was the grammar structure. And what we did for was to use a data-driven approach, linked ICA, independent component analysis, to reduce the data to 70 independent components. And these are really showing you the modes of variation of the structure across these 500 grams. It doesn't know anything about age, sex, their activities, their socioeconomic status. It only knows voxel by voxel, pixel by pixel, the information about their grammatical structure. So what we did was postdoc look at basically who had uh, amongst these uh, independent components, which one were associated with it. And we found two. The very first one covers the entire brain. And that's something that we know very well from life, uh, lifespan studies. We've got a very strong overall across the entire brain decrease of chromatin with age. First of all, with cortical pruning, et cetera. And, unfortunately later on with degeneration. But because of the data-driven approach, what we found was a more subtle component that this time explains 3% of the structural variance as opposed to 50%. Now they find a network of very clear higher order regions, these, these regions that are combining information from different parts of the brain, or we call them cross models sometimes. And in that network of grammatical regions, what we found was a very, very striking inverted U curve uh, of the grammar volume with age. And that basically tells you there's a mirroring in these regions of development and aging. And that's the very definition of lasting first step. And I'll show you that in the next slide. What happens very specifically is that you've got this very strong effect of 50% across the entire brain of a strong decrease, monotonic decrease of grammar. But then in these very specific cross-model higher order regions, you've got on top of it, this 3% effect of an inverted U curve. So what that means overall, if you take all of the picture together, this is a linear combination, is that in adolescence, you've got a protracted development of these brain regions. But in older age, around 60, you've got an acceleration of degeneration there. So these are the regions that develop later, which makes a lot of sense because they are, these are higher order regions, but also develop, uh, degenerate, earlier, they develop later, they degenerate earlier. And so the next question we asked was, well, if this network is vulnerable, uh, is the one that is ongoing the most changes during adolescence and older age around 60, well, could it be that if disorders impact onto brain structure precisely at these timelines, could they then preferentially impact on this, onto this brain network? That's exactly what we found. We uh, used this data set that had published in the past on the other, sometimes it's schizophrenia, and at the other end of the spectrum, Alzheimer's disease. And what we found was that the spatial pattern of, uh, in yellow here, the healthy, it's a healthy brain network that we found that it shows this inverted U curve, match very nicely the spatial pattern of abnormalities seen in adolescent onset schizophrenia here in green on the left and of Alzheimer's disease here on the right. Not only that, but if you compare directly adolescent onset schizophrenia and Alzheimer's disease, you see again a very nice spatial correspondence. So common distribution of the brain abnormalities between the two. And that is for those of you who are familiar with a bit of the history of neurology, perhaps not totally surprising because schizophrenia was called early on dementia precox. They show a lot of common symptoms, but also this hypothesis that the regions that develop later might be degenerating earlier and might be the most susceptible to these two disorders have been developed for decades before. In schizophrenia, it is called the lasting first out hypothesis, and in Alzheimer's disease, it is called the retrogenesis. Um, but that's exactly telling you the same thing. Last years to develop degenerate earlier. So can we understand the spread of the disease in the brain? Well, absolutely. Using a data-driven approach, that's really quite important here. The brain structural abnormalities that are common, common to Alzheimer's disease and schizophrenia are determined not so much by maybe uh, the pathological process, but the timing of the pathological process of when this 
process interact with normal brain development because if they start interacting and starting doing some mischief, if you want, damage in the brain in adolescence or in older age, well, the regions that are ongoing the most changes at that time are these higher order regions. And that's perhaps explaining why this is particularly, this brain network is particularly vulnerable to these two disorders. So in turn, it also speaks to the fact that we might be able to find common preventive strategies. One thing that I would like to, uh, to highlight here is really the fact that, I hope I've shown you that it doesn't matter whether you use a small data set or a big data set. What matters is the question you're asking. The very first one, we've got 35 subjects, but they've been really well characterized, you know, a, a deep in frequent phenotyping before, before the time. Um, and the, this helped us answer different kinds of questions than you would have with a phase two clinical trial with 156 subjects or a bit less than 500 healthy subjects. And there's no good answer here uh, um, about which one is better. It is really important to keep in mind that all of, uh, of these kind of data sets, small and big, have their benefits. And what's more is that you can combine them. So what I'm going to show you for the last five minutes here. What we've done here is to rely on the UK Biobank study. Um, so I guess maybe Michelle presented this this morning. Long-term prospective epidemiological study, Sanat did a touch on it uh, as well. Half a million people, imaging data will be available, needless to say the biggest uh, one in the world, in 100,000 UK participants. 100,000, did I say 100,000? And so the, uh, actually the, the whole processing of images and the pipeline for the processing of these images have been developed in FEMRAP with the FSL uh, team. And when I started giving this talk, uh, we had just about given, uh, scanned the 10,000 participants, that was in 2016. And when I give uh, the last one before uh, the pandemic started, uh, we had already marked uh, the 40th thousand, 40 thousandth uh, participant being scanned, which is a remarkable feat. In the space of three years, 30,000 people had been scanned. So what can we do with this? Well, what we do is we use the same kind of information we obtain from a different data set. In that case, that's the network that is most vulnerable to Alzheimer's disease that is developing later, degenerating earlier in healthy people. And we import that network into the UK Biobank. Why? Because in the UK Biobank, we've got many more people with many more information. What you can see is that we don't have this time inverted U curve. We've got half of it because they are all over 40 years old, but we see exactly the same kind of very strong half of the inverted U curve effect. But what we can see, because now we've got the numbers, we've got 40,000 people, we can look at the genetic uh, factors associated with these phenotypes. So this time we are looking at a phenotype and we're looking at the grammatic volume in these network that is most vulnerable to disease and um, uh, accelerated degeneration. What we found, and I'll go uh, quite fast to these, are different genetic variants look, doing so GWAS, gen genome-wide association study. We found single letter changes in genes that made an awful lot of sense. Uh, this one, this very specific uh, change um, variant in, in the gene, how to mediate neuroprotection during ischemia. This one might sound boring, it's a zinc and mental trust border, but actually, believe you me, it's a very interesting one. And it keeps being, it's the most pleiotropic variant, and it keeps being uh, associated with an awful lot of things. Amongst them, schizophrenia, which again gives you now another way of seeing that overlap between our healthy brain network and schizophrenia. And fluid intelligence, something that I haven't shown um, from my previous study, we, we show that that brain network is again in healthy people associated with fluid intelligence, but also with cardiovascular death. And that's going back to what Sana has shown and Michelle has shown how much the cardiovascular health is important for your brain. It is also related to tau pathology, something I mentioned at the very beginning that is involved in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, but also frontotemporal dementia. But 
these are the non-modifiable risk factors. That tells you something about the mechanisms of what is acting upon this healthy brain network. What makes it maybe a bit more vulnerable to, uh, to these disorders and to healthy aging and unhealthy aging. But we can also look at modifiable risk factors for dementia. You've seen quite a few of them now. 15 broad categories here that uh, we selected, blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, smoking, depression, inflammation, pollution, hearing, et cetera. But what we wanted to do here again was to assess the unique contribution because obviously there's a lot of shared vari variance between these, these different uh, modifiable risk factors. And it could be the case that if you go and exercise as an older person. This is not so much the exercise that is of benefit to you. It's, it's about getting dressed and getting out and, and mingling with people and socially meeting with these people before the pandemic started, obviously. So we want to be able to assess the unique contribution of each of them. And obviously there's a, a, a plethora of different variables that you can pick from the UK Biobank. So we rank them basically and choose the best ones and we look at trying to remove the effect of age. So you're answering a different question whether you consider age, which is obviously the biggest risk factor of all, there's nothing you can do about that, with or without including age. And so if you remove the effect of age and ask what above and beyond the effect of age are the most deleterious risk factors, what we found looking at a single statistical model that the most deleterious are diabetes, pollution and alcohol. And really I'd like to insist on removing the effect of age as much as you can obviously in terms of statistical modeling because pollution would not have shown up otherwise because it's slightly negatively correlated with age. Older people have been less exposed to detrimental effect, um, you know, levels of pollution in their lifetime. So finally, I hope I can answer the fourth question. Can we identify and quantify the impact of these deleterious risk factors, genetic and modifiable, onto that very vulnerable brain network? And absolutely, we can. Identify genetic variants and uh, identify the worst um, modifiable risk factors, which are diabetes, pollution, and alcohol. And that was done by combining different data sets from the small to the larger one. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, all of my collaborators uh, here in Oxford, but also uh, across the NIH, uh, Vancouver, London, uh, Oslo, Basel, uh, and some others uh, from Oxford that are outside of the film. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Gwen. You missed that, but there was a big applause here. Oh, yes. Oh, thank you. Um, let's see if there are any questions. It's okay. late. It's the last talk. <laughs> we will talk. Um, yeah, um, so here's one. With regards to the higher order control areas from your 2014 paper, do you think these regions speak to pathological changes common to the two disorders? Or could they perhaps be actively supporting resilience in these conditions? Uh, that's a very in in interesting question. Um, what we found is that this network is highly correlated and very specifically with fluid intelligence and with um, delayed recall. Uh, so prospective memory, long-term memory, if you want. So it could well be that uh, so I'm not obviously talking about the fact that the pathological process is the same. It's absolutely totally different in schizophrenia and Alzheimer's disease. But something is disturbing these brain network of higher order regions, and and probably because of that, well, that's at least what I believe. We see this array of symptoms emerge, and symptoms that can be seen as quite similar between schizophrenia and, and Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Got one more here. Yeah. We saw that in the this was for the channel activity in our past and I wonder if it goes the other way that people that get sick in the of their diet, do they have a risk chance of developing Alzheimer's So you may not have caught that, Gwen, but the question was 
do people who might have B12 um, deficiency have higher risk of developing cognitive impairment? Yes, yes, it's something that is very well known. And I think uh, any good GP seeing people on the older side uh, with a kind of typical kind of dementia type symptoms will immediately ask for blood tests. And a lot of times you will see vitamin B12 deficiency. Yeah, so it's a, it's a normal screening test for someone. It, it is It is due to the fact that elderly people have uh, lose the capability of absorbing correctly vitamin B12. So it's not necessarily that it, there's a deficiency in their diet necessarily, it's that they lose the uh, ability to absorb it properly. And then right. some shots would, would be helpful, vitamin B12 shots or and, and then taking vitamin B12. So it may not be diet, it may be absorption as well from the stomach and the small intestine. Yeah. Any other questions here? Okay. Um, so we've had we've heard a lot, Gwen, today about sort of modifiable risk factors and how that affects the brain. I mean, the, the problem is, you know, we've got this difference between macro scale that you're talking about and then micro scale and cellular scale that other people have been talking about. Is there any way that those kind of literatures can be brought together, you think, in a meaningful yeah. way? Yes, that's, I think that's where obviously uh, combining imaging and uh, cellular uh, study, molecular and cellular studies in the same kind of models, animal models, uh, comes really uh, handy. Uh, obviously, as, as we've heard, it is difficult uh, to have, uh, you know, very uh, faithful animal models, the lower you get in the kind of phylogenetical ranking. Um, mm. But obviously this is absolutely uh, crucial to be able to link the two, to, to link the different scales and obviously look uh, across, uh, across species. Another thing is, is to look at um, postmortem brains. So there is a lot of work that's been uh, being done uh, in scanning postmortem brains and then you know, looking uh, with histology at the different uh, things that are going on in that brain. Yeah, right. So, I mean, there's animal model imaging, and then you're actually saying this post-mortem brains doing the imaging and then linking the imaging changes back to exactly. the... To you the... can do reverse engineering exactly the same. And, and you know, another thing is, uh, I haven't shown it here, but in a, we've done a GWAS of all kind of... Uh, human phenotypes in, in the brain. And what we've done is from the genetic variants that we've identified is then looking into trying to induce these mutations, uh, you know, point mutations in, in wilderness and then see, mm -hmm. see what happens and try to understand the mechanisms there. And then we'll go back to human, you know. Yeah. And I've got one more question here, Gwen. Um, in light of similarities, where's it gone? Um, between schizophrenia and AD in that study you showed, is there also a shared role of neurotransmitters in AD, I presume, and schizophrenia? But that may be beyond. I'm going to ask you. <laughs> um, not, um, I don't think there is much evidence of that. Actually. No, I, again, I don't think there is a lot of commonalities in terms of. The, the pathological process per se, and what you would be able to see at the cellular and molecular level, yeah. there is quite a lot in terms of the presentation of the symptoms and the brain regions that are hit. And, and, you're, and you're really showing vulnerability of a system, aren't you? Exactly, that's really at the system level, uh, yeah. what you're saying, and probably explaining some of the, the, the common commonality in, in the symptoms, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Gwen. And uh, thanks to all of you for coming today. Hope some of you will come back tomorrow and you online as well. We've got um, a really interesting day starting off with uh, circuit level neurophysiology. And in the afternoon, we're looking at the effects of COVID on the brain, both psychological, patho pathological, and also in terms of neurological conditions that have resulted uh, from the research that's been done over the last year and a half. So anyway, thanks to all the speakers today for both symposia, they were great. Thank you very much.